Yes. And and at this stage, actually, my university also has uh, tried to initialize a more joint uh, collaboration yes. with India as, as well as the, we call the dual PhD program. Okay, so for the students, yeah, either from Taiwan or India, they should have a dual PhD degrees from both sides. And one possibility is to have a two plus two. So two mean two years in India and two years in Taiwan. Okay, so really I, 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 yeah, I, I believe that should be, you know, it should be benefit for, for both sides. Okay, mm -hmm. you have, a, yeah, you can send the students here and, or we can also send a student to USI and then to, for the student to learn the, you know, uh, the expertise from both sides. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at this stage, uh, I'm talking for, I'm uh, talking with some people from the University of uh, Hyderabad. Hyderabad, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Hyderabad, yeah, yeah. So I hope, yeah, maybe we can, uh, Pro probably, uh, oh. probably you don't know that Professor Panigrahi had a strong connection with Hyderabad University in the I past, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. I yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so maybe I, I can try to, you know, to to have a list of the uh, MOU we sign with the India Institute, and then if mm -hmm. necessary, I think I can propose to have some such kind of join, yeah. PhD program, yeah, among us, yeah. Uh, in I think we can do that. I think a good idea. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, consortium like IIT Patna, also Kokota, mm -hmm. a couple of others are the consortium collaborating yes. with right. you know, your university. I think we yeah, can initiate yeah. that. Yeah. Okay, I think that should be a question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. should we start now? Yeah, please, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, it's a pleasure to have Professor Rekang Lee. Uh, with us today. Uh, he is the head of the quantum optics group at National Tissing Hua University, Taiwan. Um, he is a professor at the Institute of Photonic Technologies at the university. He is also a professor of the Department of Electrical Engineering there. He has a joint position with the Department of Physics at the same university. He sits in many, many important uh, committees at the national level, at, at the level of university. He's also a board member of LIGO Virgo uh, uh, joint editorial board. Um, he, is, uh, he is deep into, uh, I must say he has deep interest in LIGO and he is part of various committees in LIGO collaboration. He's a part of the collaboration. He's also a senior member of Optical Society of America. He is a member of American Physical Society and he's part of many, many other important um, uh, such uh, uh, societies. With that, I would like to invite Professor Lee to tell us about simulating non-Hermitian quantum system by dilations. Professor Lee, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Professor Tass, yeah, for the introduction, yeah. So I suppose you can see my screen and see the laser point. Uh, we can see the screen, but uh, okay. the laser pointer, I'm not very sure. Uh, are okay. you, are, do, you, do you have the laser pointer on now? Yes, uh, no, so you cannot see, uh, no? It might, it might be a problem with my screen. Uh, uh, okay. do, you, do you see it? No, I, I, we don't no? see the pointer yet. Maybe no, yes, no. We, we don't see it yet. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Try then. changing the slide and then use the pointer again. Uh, okay, so that, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so uh, let me see. Yeah, yeah I, I go back. Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor yeah, uh, Penny Guahi and Professor Lowy again for inviting me to this summer school. Uh, actually, I visited uh, yeah, Kolkata and Patna in 2018. Okay, so I'm looking forward to visit uh, yeah, India again. Yeah. Okay, so today uh, I will sh yeah, share with you what we are, uh, we are doing with this uh, non Hermitian quantum system. Okay, so if you like, you can interrupt me yeah, uh, with. Yeah, any questions? Okay. 
Okay, so yeah, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce our recent activities. Okay, so as you may know, my expert is on content artists. In particular, we are working on content noise switching. I will mention yeah, uh, something related to this uh, in, the, in the slides. And we develop uh, the content state tomography to study the quantum dynamics, uh, wave function collapse. Uh, and in particular, we also apply the quantum machine learning for such kind of uh, state tomography and the quantum information processing. Okay. And at the same time, uh, yeah, as mentioned by Professor Das, I currently I am a member of uh, LIGO Virgo Kagwa uh, Global Gravitational Wave Detector. Okay, we call ourselves the VK. And so the the task for me is to yeah implement the quantum noise switching to reduce the or to enhance the sensitivity of the advanced gravitational wave detector. Okay. And so today I will yeah in addition to this I will mention the yeah how to use uh, uh, in particular such kind of PD symmetrical pseudo Hermitian system to know the yeah the to look at the quantum aspect of uh, yeah, non Hermitian quantum mechanics. Okay, so at the same time, I want to mention that there are uh, three postdoc fellows in my group uh, with eight PhD students and four master students. In particular, yeah, uh, right now, there are four Indian students for, uh, in my group. Okay, so you are welcome to come take me yeah, if you are interested in. Yeah, in these research directions. Okay, so yeah, in particular, as I say, in 2018, uh, when I visited uh, Kolkata, actually there's one student called Anandu. Yeah, so at that time, yeah, he contacted me and currently he is a second year PhD student in my group. In particular, he is working on the uh, IPNQ. Okay, so as you know, we have uh, one of the IBM hub in Taiwan. So with that hub, we can access the yeah the advanced quantum machine in IBM. For example, in this paper, uh, we use the twenty qubits yeah uh, IBM machine to implement the quantum work and see the how in particular for the graph state. And in Taiwan, in, uh, each, each year we also have the uh, hacker song, which uh, we call the Qs kit hacker song. Yeah, in particular for to solve some particular problems with IBM quantum machine. Okay. Yeah. So as I say, if you are interested, yeah, you can contact me for more details. Okay. So let's jump to the outline of today. So in, in particular, I will mention about, yeah, I will introduce the Peter Titan symmetry, uh, in particular in phase space. And then I will show you the violation of the no cyclone principle. And then I will introduce the Neymar dilation, how to look at this uh, non Hermitian or in general pseudo Hermitian Hamiltonian. And then I will show you uh, how to simulate and how to extract the internal non locality found this uh, PT Hamiltonians. Okay, so if you like, you can yeah, uh, refer to our publications. Okay, so let's move to the uh, phase space. Okay, but nevertheless, I want to yeah, share with you yeah, by asking this question, okay, what's quantum? I, I know this is a school is for quantum, but you know, for me, there's a, a very difficult uh, question to answer. So we know quantum mechanics, we know energy quantum, we know wave function collapse, uh, like uh, the coherence, we know the non classical quality, okay, Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's state, like a real, real entanglement EPR pair, yeah, or non locality or stealing. So actually there are many aspects I, I believe you can see and you can learn in this school. Okay. Nevertheless, today I will yeah, start from the very page. So you know, I suppose you know they call the ACM of quantum mechanics. So yeah, means that there are some statements without proof. So for example, we are working on the 
in quantum mechanics, we are yeah, working with the state. Okay, so in particular, the state is denoted by the precise, and then there's an element in the complex here space. And we use the observable, okay, so for some physical properties, uh, which should be Hermitian to guarantee the uh, the measurement or the observable should be real or corresponding to the physical property. And you know there are some probability, yeah, and the wave function collapse, okay, belong uh, among the the measurement or among the inner polar as well as the evolution of the quantum state for closed quantum should be unitary. Okay, so so that, that's what we learn, you know, from the textbook of quantum mechanics, and. People take this for granted, but nevertheless, there are some, uh, you know, some people want to challenge this uh, Asian in particular. For example, can we have non-Hermitian quantum mechanics or instead of the Hermitian, Hermeticity? And for example, yeah, can we see or can we project the, the Hilbert space? Okay, in particular, what I say is called a quantum state tomography. Can we see the the state vector, or can we know the collapse or the decoherence? Okay, for example, through the quantum measurement, yeah, including weak measurement or, and so on. Or can we know the, the age of time? Okay, the evolution of the, the time evolution of the quantum system, or in particular, can we apply something like uh, entangled history? Yeah, to answer this, yeah, uh, this question, okay. So today, as I say, I will focus on the second part, in particular for the non-Hermitian quantum system. Okay, so the idea is, uh, yeah, we know in the textbook, we are asked to have the Hermeticity. Okay, Hermeticity means uh, H equal to H taker. Okay, so the uh, taker means uh, transpose plus complex conjugated. And such kind of uh, Hermeticity can guarantee the eigenvalue, or in particular, the energy of the Hamiltonian should be real, and the probability is conserved. But as mentioned by the carpenter, as I show in this slide, so he such kind of hermeticity is a mathematical Asian or a physical Asian. Okay, so as I said, it's a, it's a, a, a very old question, and in particular, uh, if we went back to 30 years, before, yeah, in the, as you can see in this paper, in, yeah, uh, by Carpenter and his collaborators say, okay, can we have a non Hermitian Hamiltonian? Okay, so as I show here, there's a Hermitian system can guarantee the eigenvalue, the spectrum is real, but can we still have the real spectrum, real eigenvalue, even for a non Hermitian system? Of course, in general, this uh, is not the uh, true. So there should be some you know, additional condition. So here, they, they impose the weak condition called the PD symmetry. Okay, so by such kind of PD symmetry, you should have the possibility to have the real spectrum, even for non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Okay, so in particular, uh, the PD symmetry is defined here P is for the parity, and T is for the time reversal. Okay, so the simple idea is that you just put a clock in front of the middle, so you have the yeah middle symmetry, and the clock inside the middle will you know will work in the time reversal. Yeah. Okay. So this is a PD symmetry, and the called the PD symmetry Hamiltonian is the Hamid which commute with PT. Okay, so it should, it's not only commute with P or T, but with the PT together. In this case, we know if the Hamiltonian is a commute with PT, then the eigenvalue of both should be the same, it should be the real. But as I say, yeah, as we know, we cannot guarantee the eigenvalue is always real. Okay, so they, sometimes it happens for called a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, so I, I'll give you a, one example. Actually, there's an example show in the paper, yeah, by Bender. And in the paper, as I mentioned, in the 1998, uh, 
So they illustrate this uh, long Hermitian Hamiltonian with PD symmetry with this uh, P square plus S square and the, uh, let me see, and times I S to the power epsilon. Okay, so we know actually this is the simple harmonic oscillator, but it's generalized with the additional term. So when epsilon is zero, we know all the eigenvalue should be real, okay, and discrete. And surprisingly, when epsilon is larger than zero, the, the energy remains real, as we can see here. So this is called the unbroken PD symmetry. On the other hand, when epsilon is smaller than zero, yeah, the eigen energy cannot be guaranteed to be real. So this is called a broken. Okay, so here we have the boundary, uh, and what people call this called the excisional point. So this is the point, you know, between the PD symmetry. Okay, so as I said, this is a very simple and very you know standard example of the generalized simple harmonic oscillator. But nevertheless, even for me, uh, we don't know why there it is such kind of essential the you know the energy yeah is is modified. Okay, so yeah, as, as a, this is for school, so I I. Illustrate again with this simple harmonic oscillator. So I suppose yeah, you should know this. If we have a Hamiltonian, yeah, like a p square over two m, yeah, uh, there's a corresponding to the kinetic energy plus one half k s square corresponding to the uh, potential energy. Okay, so we know the eigen energy as I mentioned. Yeah, if you say the uh, the normalize the constant to Actually, the energy is real, as you show here. And the ground state is the energy, okay, in particular for this case, there's a one half h power omega. And for the first SI state, we have three half h This one is five half h power omega, so on and so forth. So there are several things that you, should, you can see. Yeah, the energy is quantized, okay. And the energy difference, between the eigenstates are equal, they are equally spacing. And then there is, there is a called a zero point energy. Okay, so this is the ground state of the simple harmonic oscillator, but the corresponding energy is non zero. Yeah. Okay, so I, I suppose you should be familiar with this. And then we know if you portray that this eigenstate, we call the Lambert state, okay, or call the Fox state. Yeah. There's an n equal to zero, n equal to one, n equal to two, to the s space. Okay, you have the eigen wave function in terms of Hermite Gaussian polynomial. Okay. Okay. So, so that's what I believe you should know. Yeah. Or you you can learn from the yeah standard quantum mechanics textbook. Okay. So I just emphasize again, and in particular, there's a called the vacuum state. Okay. But for the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, so denoted by the zero, okay, and zero is the uh, with the energy is non zero, actually the non zero uh, zero point energy, okay, and so let's come back to the you know to the generalized PD Hamiltonian. So here I just modify the uh, Hamiltonian, but it's almost the same. So there's a p square minus uh, i uh, i s to the Oh, minus i s to the power epsilon. Okay, so epsilon equal to two, we have a p square plus s square. Okay, and so one task you should know is you have the Hamiltonian. So how to find the corresponding eigen energy. Okay, so for the previous case, previous case you can use either by the Hermite polynomial, okay, to find the eigen function, or by the introduce the A taker and A or called the creation and annihilation operator. Okay, so you can find the eigenstate. But for this generalized Hamiltonian, uh, what we apply is the brute force. Okay, we write down the Hamiltonian, uh, we write down the this Hamiltonian in the matrix form. Okay, so in terms of focus state, as you can see here, and in general, you can use uh, force state and then introduce the yeah the hypergeometrical function to 
to to use as a basis to 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 to, to diagonalize this Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is why you can see. Yeah, as I mentioned to you, uh, numerically. Right, so here, as I say, I, I change the notation. So, uh, so the original notation is p squared plus s squared times i s to the power epsilon. But here, I I combine the epsilon uh, into the to the i s to the power. So in short, uh, when I say epsilon equal to two, corresponding to the original paper epsilon to equal to zero. Okay, so as you can see here, what I show is p squared minus i s to the power epsilon. So when epsilon equal to two we have a P square plus is a square. Okay, so as you can see, we have the eigenenergy. Uh, I normalize to one, three, five. Okay, so this is epsilon equal to two. And then when epsilon is large than two, all the eigenvalues are real. Okay, and then we have eigenenergy, as I said, is unbroken. And on the other side, when epsilon is smaller than two, we have the broken, yeah, PD symmetry means uh, the eigenvalue is no longer the uh, real, okay, for all the eigenvalues. Yeah, so there's a numerical solution. Yeah, as I say, just an illustration, yeah, to let you know if you have a Hamiltonian, what you can do first to find the eigen spectrum or eigen energy spectrum. Yeah, so if you are curious, you can, yeah, go further, for example, from two to higher four, six, seven, uh, eight, and so on and so forth. It's, it's much complicated. Actually, yeah, before the pandemic, I just have a chance to talk to Carpenter, yeah, in Sanya in China. And actually, I'm also curious about the, what happens, yeah, when epsilon is smaller than one. Okay, so if we go back to this one, we are talking about epsilon is larger than one. Okay, so epsilon larger la uh, than two, we have un uh, unbroken PD image. Okay, smaller than two, we have a PD uh, broken symmetry, and that's one. All the eigenvalues are, becomes compass number. Okay, but how what happens is if epsilon is smaller than one, and so uh, I'm sorry, that is long duration. Uh, so at that time I asked this question to to Bender, as you can see, he showed yeah there should be some uh, uh, singularity yeah or some asymptotic behavior. Yeah, in particular, the epsilon minus one. Okay, so what I want to say is, uh, yeah, this model Hamiltonian is quite, you know, quite complicated than, than we think. Okay, so, but today I will introduce the another, uh, another point of view to see what's the energy for, uh, the energy for different. Okay, uh, I saw that, uh, I can stop here. In the chart, I saw one question. Okay, the question is, are uh, the I energies for different epsilon are uh, equal space? Okay, so the answer is is no. Yeah, it's no. As you can see, the space, uh, the space is equally uh, space. Okay, is only equally spaces when epsilon equal to two. Or when we have the simple harmonic oscillator. On the other hand, the yeah, the, the energy difference is not the same. Okay. It's more complicated, as I say, it's more complicated than, than we think. Okay, but so I will, in addition to the eigen energy, I will use another yeah methodology to, to illustrate the quantum system. Yeah, uh, that's what I call the phase phase core idea. Of uh, you can, so cash call means uh, we have a which as I say is a minus two m for the kinetic energy and plus uh, uh, the one half k is square okay for the potential energy, but you know the solution for this as I show here, okay so you. Uh, so can, can you see the cur uh, my cursor? Um, I no. Uh, yeah, we can see your. Cursor. I think we can. Yes, it's moving now. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay, I okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah I should Okay, so we know the solution for the in the case called mechanics. Okay, for for example, this you on the right to the left, and then come back again. So we recall the. <coughs> Yeah, as a time sequence of the solution, which is a sinusoidal wave. 
And instead of this, we can map this barber into the, we call the face torture. I mean, the way you call the, okay, here in the right, which we can see right, and then move to the left. Yeah, at the same time, we also need to know the velocity. Okay, so you know, this face space is defined by the position and the velocity. Okay, so for this pendulum, we know there's a called a periodic hope. There's a close. Okay, so that's a classical idea. And then for quantum, actually, in particular for EM wave, we can use the same analogy because we know the solution for electrical magnetic wave is also a sinusoidal wave. Okay, it is for the plane wave. And then, okay, but we have the wave. So instead of using the single point, okay, I would like to use the wave function in the phase space. Okay, so I will show you here for, for the next one. I will show, okay, so here I show you the motion of the wave package inside a simple harmonic oscillator. So as you can see, we have a wave package, okay, which is, is moving inside the phase space, the phase space by S and P. Okay, so as you can see here, I recall this wave function in the S and P for the quadrature. Okay, so instead of the single point for the classical particle, I need to use the phase space for the wave package. So what kind of the wave package I'm talking about in particular, wave package is a three dimensional uh, distribution or in the, like this one is, uh, I use the a circle to denote the, the width of the wave package. Okay, so for example, I recall the uh, half width at the, uh, uh, if the half maxima. Okay, so in this case, I use a, a circle to denote the wave package. So there's a, as you can see, there's a projection of the wave package in the phase space. Okay, so there's a, as you can see, there's a two dimensional Gaussian wave package. Okay, so I just show you again. So there's the like classical motion of the particle, okay, in the phase space. Mm -hmm. So you can see there's uh, the analogy between the classical and quantum, okay. Oh, sometimes the voice. Okay, I, I try to, yeah. Okay, so, so that's what we know for, for the, yeah. So in, in particular, I use the weakener function. Okay, so that's the wave function in the ASM. So in particular, I show you, which is a two-dimensional Gaussian wave package in the weakener function. Or in the, but as you can see, we also have n equal to one for the single photon state, and n equal to two, and so on and so forth. But as you can see, for such kind of uh, fog state, in particular n equal to one, there are some we call the non classical non classical state. And the reason we call the non classical state, as you can see, if we use the phase space as a distribution. Actually, as you can see here, we have the possibility to have to show the, uh, to have the negative value, which is very strange in the case called idea with the negative property. Uh, so with this, that's the um, reason. Sorry, uh, can I yeah? interrupt you once? Your yes. voice is somehow breaking. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I <laughs> just have to uh, so some, it's, a, it's, a bit of, it's kind of random. Uh, it's not random. very systematic. It, it is uh, mostly random. Uh, then, then. Sorry, we are yeah. able to hear him. We are okay. able to hear Professor Lee. Okay, so it's better now? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Even in the no? chat, there is a you know comment by somebody. Yeah, yeah, I, I see, I see. But uh, let me see what, what's the problem. But so we don't have any problem. We are able to hear. Okay. It's continuous for you, Prashant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see. Okay, so. Please go ahead. Maybe it's okay, okay. system specific. It's possible. Okay, yeah, yeah. So 
Maybe you please go ahead because that could okay, be... Okay, go Okay. So, okay, I suppose... I don't know what's the problem. I think the problem is with the microphone. Uh, okay, so it's. I don't know. Okay, so I want to illustrate again. Okay, I use is the uh, in particular with the weakened function and weakened function outside probability distribution because we cannot make quantum to the case code. Okay. But what we can do is by perform the data I will introduce it called the balance of homotide detector. We can yeah perform the measurement on the weakness function directly. Okay. Okay, so I show you yeah here. Yeah I yeah. Okay. So here I show you some experimental measurement in my group. Okay. So what you are going to see is the time sequence. Okay. In terms of the found detector. And then, okay. So if you have an input, which is the vacuum. Uh, so I, I, I look at the chart. Okay. So let me see. Let me see. Yeah, uh, I see the quaking will be this if the microphone put a bit of far. Okay, I, I will try to do that. Okay. Yeah, so it's better. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, yeah, okay. I, so yeah, <laughs> I just, maybe I, yeah, maybe this, this one is better, yeah? Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, what you are going to see is the recall of the uh, the current from the photo detector as in a time sequence. Okay, so if as I say, uh, for the electrical mag magnetic wave, there always it is the, the vacuum, okay, the ground state. So we just perform the measurement, okay, if the detector is sensitive enough, and what you are going to see is uh, you can recall the signal from the photon dial, and then you transfer this signal, uh, signal, the time sequence into the histogram. And then you can see, okay, the average value is zero. That's why we expect it. Uh, why we expect it because there's a vacuum, okay? So it's zero, but you have the distribution function like a Gaussian, okay? So actually that's the, illustration of the ground state in terms of the measurement. Okay, so once again, I just show you, that's what we learned from the textbook. Okay, we have the zero, which project to the S space, which give you the Gaussian distribution. At the same time, you can also perform the measurement in the P space, okay, which is also the Gaussian distribution. So that's what I say, we, for the uh, vacuum state, we are talking about two-dimensional Gaussian wave package. And you also know that the Fourier transform of Gaussian is also a Gaussian, but the width in the two space, the product is should be confined or there should be a, a lower bound, and which is, is also a, 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 a illustration of the uncertainty relation. Okay, in particular, theta s square times theta p square should be large or equal than the one over four. Or here, I, I rescale h bar. Okay, so actually, that's what we perform by the balanced homotide detector. And then by this one, as I mentioned in the very beginning, we use this, uh, the, uh, the, the width of the half maximum of this two-dimensional Gaussian wave package, we can use a circle to denote the, the quantum uh, distribution of the vacant state. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I think that the, uh, one of the take home messages you should know is, that, okay, the vacant is not empty, okay? Because you know, in addition to the mean value, okay, it's zero, but we, we should, yeah, take the, we should take the, 
with, with nature, or when I say with nature, is the distribution function into account. So what I say here is for the KH cost state, okay, we use a single point, okay, in the phase space. But for the quantum state, we, if we are talking about the coherent state, we, use, we need to use the, the circle, okay? And this circle is the width defined in the data S or data P, and the product of this uh, data S and data P, yeah, there's a, a, a lower bound we need, to, we need to follow, okay? So for example, I use this notation, okay, like data S one, equal to one half, data S2 equal to one half. So the, the, the product is one over four. But there's one more thing you can do, you can perform called a squeeze. Okay, so as you know, even though we, we need to follow the uncertainty relation, but actually the uncertainty relation just limit the, the product of the two quadrature, okay, data S1 times data S2. But we can have one, one Actually, can, I, can I can I ask a question yeah, here? Yeah, yeah, Something yeah, which please. is confusing. I yeah. mean, when you you know quantum Hamiltonians, for example, even harmonic oscillator and so on. Yes. When you write the classical one, we yeah. can take the classical Hamiltonian and then symmetrize it and promote it to quantum mechanics, and they become quantum Hamiltonian. Usually, imagine imagine a product of X and P in the Hamiltonian. You will symmetrize yeah. it and then make it Hermitian. So now when we write these non-Hermitian terms, yes. does it mean that they have no classical analog or how, yeah, how should uh, I, how yeah, should I, that, uh, you know, okay. I'll answer question. this, uh, I'll answer this question in, in, the, in the last, actually this is okay. one of the, yeah, the puzzle for me, what's the case called limit for this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, yeah. Uh, in, in, in a sense, you would be very tempted to think that because it's non-Hermitian, you're losing phase yeah, yeah, information, yeah, you yeah, should yeah. become sure, classical, sure, sure. but it's sure, not sure, clear sure. what should be sure, the classical. Sure, sure. So, so as I say, there's also a puzzle for me, actually in the, maybe I can show you, yeah, but uh, I will come back. Sorry, to I don't want to break no, no, the floor, no, 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 no problem, no problem. Yeah, actually let's say one of the, 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 the the page called limit of this. Uh, let's come back to this question later. Okay. Sure. And the uh, other question, yeah. which is uh, again the little so, what is the sacredness of H cut once you have a non Hermitian ham? Is H cut sick? You are getting into uncertain relation. Of course, you have normalized it yes. with a dimensionless constant at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I start thinking in terms of H cut, is it, do you have a new H cut in the prob problem, the analog of H cut? Because you know these two are related. In a sense, we have a point show bracket in the classical limit, which yes. we promote yeah, to yeah. quantum mechanics, and yeah, then H cut, yeah. H cut becomes a sacred thing there. Now uh, you have some other numbers sitting there, but it's 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 cut sacred for you or not? And then again, it comes back to the same question in some sense. Yeah, yeah. It's, so maybe I I can uh, try to answer your question later. Yeah, maybe. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah just yeah. I wanted to. Okay. Yeah. So so what I illustrate here is just for the standard or the simple harmonic oscillator with the Hermitian one. Okay. So but nevertheless, I I want to say is uh, okay for the Vacuum, we also already know this. And as I say, even for the vacuum, we have one more degree of freedom to do is to do the squeeze. So as I say, we can uh, squeeze means we can modify the distribution function of the vacuum. Okay, in particular for the squeeze vacuum. And the idea, what I show is here, I'll just repeat again. So in for the vacuum, we have the, the we can, for example, squeeze by change one of the quadrature for I denote as a data y1, which is smaller. But at the same time, we need to pay the price. The price is the data y2, the, the conjugate one it becomes large. So what I show here is uh, we introduce a, a factor like a exponential minus two gamma. Okay, so one for one component, if gamma is is smaller, but as I say, for the other component, which should be the, the with the exponential plus to gamma. And in this case, the uh, one is smaller, the other one is, is bigger. So what I show here is, uh, as I say, for vacuum state, 
Okay, it, it is everywhere, but we can use some kind of squeezing to change this profile. So as you can see here, the 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 noise distribution is no longer uniform, no longer a circle. But right now you have a ellipse. Ellipse means in one component which is smaller, but at the other component which is bigger. Okay, so I just show you again. Uh, this is what we did with the squeeze baking. So we put the from the optical pedometrical oscillator. So like the brief data as a time sequence. So as you can see here, but once again, as you can see, the, the mean, the expectation value is zero. Okay, so the, because it's baking, but as I say, we still have the Gaussian wave package if we transfer this into the histogram. But at some time, we have the wave package with very important Gaussian wave the possibility to squeeze the, the noise distribution with a smaller, uh, with a Gaussian wave package, but with a smaller width. Okay, so this is called a squeeze. And actually, for this, this is what you can see by we have the possibility to reduce the quantum noise. So when I say quantum noise, it means the quantum baking. Okay. So yeah, that, that's what we did in in the in the lab. We have the yeah prepared the quantum state, uh, in particular by the quantum device. So here is the optical pedometric oscillator, and so that's what you see. And by performing the we can record the data and then we either perform in, we want to know the probability distribution function either by the maximum likelihood estimation, okay, or by the uh, machine learning. In particular, we apply the uh, convolution neural network. In a few minutes. So what you are seeing here is uh, yeah, we can use the machine learning to reconstruct the wave function as well as the density matrix yeah, in, in, in less than one second. Okay, so here you show this uh, the real, almost a real time image of the wave function. Okay, or the, um, in not only the wave function in the weakener function, but also the density matrix uh, as well as the purity, okay? Yeah, okay. So we, with this, as I say, that's the idea to, you know, for, for the gravitational wave. So, you know, for the gravitational, we suffer from many noises from the laser, from the seismic noise, there's still noise, or there's still gas, thermal noise, but as you can see, there are quantum noise. And by using this squeeze, we can enhance the sensitivity of the, yeah, of the detector. Okay. In yeah. So if you are interested, yeah, you can have a look at this paper. Yeah, we uh, last year we just demonstrated. Yeah, yeah, with the uh, LIGO, Virgo, and Cargo. Okay, as well as a trio in Germany. Yeah, for the squeezing as a function of frequency at uh, one hundred hertz. Okay, so there are different kind of noises you need to yeah deal with, including the yeah uh, quick. Uh, Amplitude squeezing and frequency squeezing as a function of uh, uh, frequency. Okay, so so that's for on the end of this for the simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, so I I'll come back to yeah maybe the the, the question from the professor Das uh, uh, and the others about the long Hermitian system. Okay, so once again let's come back to this uh, uh, long Hermitian Hamiltonian as I say which is uh, you know it has p square but plus uh, I s to the power epsilon. Okay, so here what I show is the weakener function of the solution. So as I say, in addition to the eigen energy, we could, we at the same time we also have the uh, eigen state. So in particular, I just show you the ground state. Okay, so this epsilon equal to two. That's what we know is a simple harmonic oscillator. So which is a, a two dimensional Gaussian state. 
Uh, so in terms of phase space, there's a circle. And then if we change the epsilon smaller, smaller, you see, uh, you can, I'm sorry here, you see the wave function in the phase space is, uh, is modified. Okay. And then, so that, that, uh, I think there are uh, the several uh, scenes you can see from the wave function. You can see the, the wave package is, uh, you know, is modified by keep the symmetry, the, uh, the middle symmetry in the, in the S, okay? And then there's until epsilon equal to one. At the same time, you can also look at this, uh, in particular this point, what I show is uh, uh, epsilon equal to 1.42 something. Okay, so for the ground state, the eigenenergy is real. Uh, for the first and the second SI state, or for the other SI state, the eigenenergy becomes compass number. And in particular, for the first and second ground state, the, the eigenenergy uh, compass conjugated. So you can see the wave function, they, you know, they look like the, the symmetry of, of uh, with each other. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so maybe you, you can think about, so what, what should be, you know, the, the area that defined by the uncertainty relation in this, yeah, uh, wave function in the, in the PD symmetric Hamiltonian. But at that time, as I say, for us, that's just a, a illustration of the wave function. So we do not know exactly what the, you know, what the, the physical meaning here, so we look for the other uh, quantity we call the weak enough flow. Okay, so the idea is, is this. We know the weak enough function. So as I show you, the, which is the icon, uh, it's the presentation of the wave function in the S and P. Uh, you can introduce the continuity equation. Okay, but it means uh, you think about the weak enough function as a, something like a, a density function. And then by this, uh, partial partial t of the density function, you should have the 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 current, okay, or the flow of the system. So that, that's the idea you can see. So in particular, what I show you before for this squeeze, there are many arrows here denoted by the uh, white color. So which denote the the flow or the flow. When I say flow, is a weakened flow, the duration of the weakened flow. So you can see that the squeeze is along this duration. Uh, if we are interested, you can look at the paper by the yeah by Ole Stilner uh, Naka, which they introduced more complicated uh, complicated structure in the weakened flow. Okay, so here I just show you again what should be the weakened flow of the PD Hamiltonian. So in the left, which is the Hamiltonian, uh, is the ground state of the weakened function as I show you before, the epsilon equal to two, which should be a circle or the two-dimensional Gaussian wave package. So if you look carefully, actually you can see, let me see. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, sorry, I will see. So you can see some, I don't know, if we, uh, can you see this? Uh, so you can oh. see some yeah, flow inside of this. They are circulated yeah, along the, the center. Okay, so what should be the scenario for n equal to one? Okay, so as you can see the n equal to one, the flow, the, the circulation of flow is, is modified, okay, due to this uh, uh, long emission property. Okay, so uh, in the paper, yeah, in this paper, we illustrate the, the flow of PD Hamiltonian. For example, for the uh, for the top, is for the first uh, is high state, from the left is a uh, simple harmonic oscillator, that's what we know. In the middle one is unbroken, and then for C is broken. And on the bottom, what we show is the second is I state. Okay, again, for the simple harmonic oscillator, unbroken and the broken. Okay. So, you know, with the flow, so, we even know. Uh, yeah. a question, sorry, a question yeah. once again. Sure, sure. So here the field, the vector field, can ha can it have divergence? Probably yeah, not, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can have a finite, yeah, yeah. it can have a source and a sink? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So that's what okay. I am going to illustrate. Okay, so we introduced the Gauss-Ostro-Gwaski uh, uh, theory, but there's a general idea of divergence theory. Okay, mm -hmm. so the question is, uh, we know the flow, okay, in this two-dimensional phase space. 
So can we find the source? Okay. I see, I see. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what I show here is uh, for the first uh, inside state. And then, uh, as I say, in, in the left, I show uh, the function of epsilon. And for the first uh, inside state, so for the first uh, inside state, the eigen, the corresponding eigen energy remains real as long as epsilon is large than 1.42 something. And as you can see here, because we don't have the analytical solution, but we check numerically up to 10 digits. Okay, so the, the, okay, so what we see is even though the flow is modified, okay, is not a regular circle, but the divergence is remains zero as long as the uh, eigen energy is real. In other words, if the system is a PT unbroken, means the eigen energy is real, yeah, the, the source in this flow is zero. On the other hand, yeah, if the system is in the broken PT symmetric scenario, yeah, there, there are some source, but we don't know what's the source, but there are some source you, you need to find. Okay, yeah. Okay, so as I say, that's just the, yeah, the, the illustration about the, in general, if you have a Hamiltonian, what you can do, what you can do, you can find the eigen energy. Okay, there's an eigen energy spectrum. You can find the wave function. You can find the construct the weakener distribution, and then as well as of the flow. Okay, that's what you can do. But um, maybe I can come back to the question. Yeah, is there something we know? or something related to the case called limiter. So at this stage, I will postpone this question because we don't have a clear answer at this stage, okay? So I will move to the next part about the violation of non scoring principle, okay? Okay, so what I illustrated, uh, yeah, is, is the, this called a generalized harmonic cause later, as I said, is a continuous model, like a P square plus S square, with some modification. But I would say this is a, a toy model. A toy model means I don't know, yeah, what's the, you know, fundamental origin or the, you know, classical limit of this. But if we move to the, the other one, I call the spin one half or the two more couple. Of, okay, so that's the other Hamiltonian I want to illustrate. Okay, which is a, just a two by two matrix. Okay, so there's a two by two means one corresponding to spin up, the other one corresponding to the spin right, or there's one mode, or mode uh, in the left and mode in the right, okay. So in particular, this is also the model, yeah, studied by Bender. So the idea is this Hamiltonian. So as you can see, this Hamiltonian, uh, when alpha is zero, we just have, yeah, permission Hamiltonian. But when alpha is non-zero, okay, H is not the same as H taker, and moreover, when alpha approach to plus minus pi over two, we have the uh, the broken PD uh, phase. Okay, what I mean is that this two by two matrix, you can easily find the eigenstate, as I show here, and the eigen energy. And the eigen energy remains real numbers as long as alpha uh, is not equal to pi or plus or minus pi over two. Okay. So when, as you can see here, alpha is zero, we have three eigen energy. Alpha is not zero, but not approach pi over two, we also have the real eigen energy. So this is, a, as I said, it's a PD Hamiltonian. And with this Hamiltonian, you can find a time evolution operator, which is defined as exponential minus I H T. Okay, I, I said the H bar equal to one. So just pay attention here, the U is not unitary. But I just due to the convention that the U is the evolution. And the question proposed by Bender is if you prepare the state, the initial state, as a one needle, as I mentioned to you, that's like a spin up. Okay, so there's one needle. Then how long it takes for this spin up state to evolve into the needle one to the spin down? 
So this is called the spin flip. And surprisingly, if you have you have in your state one little um, apply the, the U, okay, the time evolution operator, you can find the, the state per side of the T as, as I write down here. And the time to approach little one goes to little if alpha approach minus pi over two. So it means that for this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, the spin flip, the time is, a, is almost little if this system goes to the, the broken, the PD symmetric broken, okay? And in optics, you can use the analogy, as I said, the P squared over two M, like the deflation term, and then the potential corresponding to the reflective index. So it means that if you want to have the PD symmetry in optics, you, the potential need to satisfy what I write down here. The potential V of S should be equal to V star of minus S. It means the reflective index, okay, for the, for the real part should be an even function. And for the imaginary part should be an other function. Okay, so we know for in optics, the reflective index corresponding to the change of the, uh, the, the uh, what I show you, the, the reflective index. So for example, for this two more coupler, Okay, so we have the, as I write down here in the couple more equation, we have E1 and E2. So E1 denote the, the mode in the left, E2 denote the mode in the right. So we have two more. They couple by the coupling coefficient, kappa, okay, in the of diagonal turn. But at the same time, for, for the mode in the left, E1, we have gamma G, as you can see here, yeah, there's exponential growth. So that's what I mean, called the game. And for the E2 in the right, we have gamma L, which corresponding to the lows. Okay, so we should have a game equal to those. So for, for the conventional coupler, we only have the real eigen value. Okay, real eigen value means one in the left, the other one in the right, and which is an even function. Okay, so we know the coupler between these two, but uh, for the PD symmetrical coupler, not in addition to the real icon, uh, real, uh, real part of the reflective index, we, there, we also need to impose the imaginary part. So for example, in the right, uh, show by the green, we have the game, okay, which is larger than little, but in the left, which will be right, okay. So in the, in the middle one, you see below the threshold means the gamma G, is smaller than kappa. So means the system remains in the unbroken PT symmetric, means the eigenvalue is real. In, in, in terms of up, up the eigenvalue means the propagation constant. So it means we have the oscillation between two sides. But on the other hand, if the eigenvalue becomes complex, uh, becomes complex number, there's no oscillation or coupling between these two. Okay. So as you can see, for this system actually corresponding to what I illustrated in the very beginning, yeah, let's say, you know, let's say, uh, let's say, uh, kappa, or here I use S in the of diagonal turn. And in one side we have uh, I gamma G, but here there's I sine alpha. On the other hand, we have I uh, minus I gamma, okay, which is minus I sine alpha. Okay, so you can see here, yeah, when alpha is zero, we have the conventional or the permission system. And here I show the simulation of the uh, probability in the two uh, two modes, okay, denoted by P1 and P2. So you can see the oscillation. Okay, so which is corresponding to the oscillation or the coupling or in terms of two level system, that's what we call the Robby oscillation, okay, with the oscillation. But at the same time, when alpha is, it's not little. We still have the oscillation for the unbroken PD symmetry. But as you can see, the oscillation becomes very fast. Okay, and then slow, fast, slow. So means uh, there's a, uh, the ultra fast spin flip mentioned in, in the, by, by Bender in the, in the very beginning. Okay, so you can also 
use the similar idea of two modes. Well, for example, here you can for the resonators, okay, one in the in the in the left, the other one in the in the right to to mimicker this such kind of PD symmetrical system. And you can also use the you know uh, gain loads, but not in the transverse direction, but in the longitudinal direction to have such kind of unit directional uh, reflection is yeah material. Okay. So actually, you know, such kind of application in artists and atoms, uh, yeah, is very popular. Uh, uh, so in particular, for example, we use this PD images to study some kind of optical system, including the good henchman shift or the passive PD Hamiltonian coupler or the optical bistability, as well as the not only PD symmetry, but also PD anti-symmetry or how to realize this in the atomic system, like uh, readable atoms. Okay, so if you are in interested, there are you know, many activities in this direction. Okay, but nevertheless, what I want to show today is uh, in terms of artists, or in, in terms of content artists. Okay, so once again, I'm going to deal with this two by two Hamiltonian. And then I uh, introduce the fear quantization. So it means uh, I have the mode in the mode one and mode two, but I introduced the, the head as a uh, annihilation operator. Okay. So I have the uh, operators for two modes. Okay. So I, it's two by two. I can easily find all the solutions as you can see here. So as a function of distance or the function of time. However, in terms of quantization, not only you know put a, this uh, height, I need to take care about the commutation relation. So for example, I need to have a1, a1 taker, okay, equal to one, because they are bosonic sphere. But if we introduce this operator into this PT Hamiltonian, you have the problem, or what's the problem that I show here? The commutation relation, okay, for A1 and A2, they are not conserved. Okay. So that's the, you know, the, 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 the problem you need to solve if you want to talk about the quantum properties of PT Hamiltonian. Okay. So how to do with this? Okay. The simple way to do is, you know, instead of the operators, you need to introduce the linear noise. Okay. So as I say, in terms of optics, when I say uh, the left and right, so we are talking about the, the game and those. So for the game and those, there should be some kind of uh, the raised bar or the, the in terms of open system. Okay, so if you introduce the, the noise operator, as I denote here, N1 and N2, yeah, the, for the two fields, the corresponding bosonic commutation relation can be satisfied as right down here, A1, A1 taker equal to one, as well as A2, A2 taker equal to one. Okay. So, so that's a formal way to, to deal with quantum, yeah, uh, quantum optics for this uh, PD Hamiltonian. The other way you can do is uh, you can introduce the new normalization. Okay, so instead of the A1, A2, you introduce phi one and phi two, and then the the problem with the commutation relation can be yeah can be solved by this normalization. Okay. But as you can see here, the a one the coefficient capital a one and b capital a two is what I show here. Actually, they are function of the z the distance. So it means you need to perform the normalization as a function of the mean. Okay, so which is very, you know, is very artificial for me. And so that, that's the, the problem actually, you know, stopped me for a while. So for example, if we choose the Korean state as the input, and then we can, you know, regenerate what I say before for the red color. Okay, that's the alpha equal to zero. We have oscillation. Uh, for the blue one, as you can see that the alpha is non-lethal for the PD Hamiltonian, non-hermitian Hamiltonian, 
So you can see we still have the coupling or the oscillation, but the slope is not a constant. Okay, the oscillation frequency is not a constant. So sometimes we have a very fast. Uh, uh, can I make a comment here? Yes, yeah. yes. This is, so I think once you have the non Hermitian system, your yes. left eigenstates and la yeah. right eigenstates are different. Yes. And now yes. when you're yes. trying to second quantize, probably yes. the issue is it's not the same operator which is creating the left eigenstate. They are not the yes. same as what is creating the right eigenstate. Yes. And you are yes. saying that this is one way to fix that problem. Is that uh, what you're saying? Yeah, you are right. So that's the problem I try to point out. So you are right. So the left and right, they are not the same. So this is what I am going to say. And so so uh, what I want to say here is uh, it's not easy to, or it's not trivial to introduce the quantum you know, quantum uh, operator for, for PD Hamiltonian. You should be very careful about what you are looking for. Yeah, you, you are right, you are right. The left and right, they are not the same. Yeah, so so that's the, the mm -hmm. what I'm going to, to say with the dilation, okay? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the problem I want to point out. So the problem is, uh, you know, we are talking about long emission system. So in general, as I say, even for this uh, yeah, spin half, spin down and spin up, uh, in general, there should be the dissipative system or the open system. So, so for me, you know, if we want to go beyond the Herm Hermitian system, such kind of PD Hamiltonian is an additional degree of freedom. So when I say additional degree of freedom means uh, because we go beyond the her Hermitian system. Okay, so for me, there should be more we can explore. And however, as I mentioned by yeah, Professor Das, uh, such kind of symmetry for the, you know, is, is also a constraint we need to follow. So for me, it's not an easy problem, you know, but I say I call it a more or less problem because we don't know, you know, we can go outside the boundary of a Hermitian system or we need to follow some kind of constraint. Okay, so so that's a problem we 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 we, we try to answer at, at that time. So as I say, yeah, until now I only illustrate you know eigenvalues, eigenstate, but uh, in terms of quantum mechanics, is not only this. We also need to consider the probabilistic in interpretation. Okay, the here space uh, here space with a positive matrix or the unitality as well as the inner product. So there are many things that we need to worry about. Okay, so uh, so what we did at that time is, okay, you know, for me, there are many uh, strange things. So we say, okay, maybe we can ask uh, Edison, Bob. Okay, so the idea is uh, maybe we can have a, a system shared by Edison and Bob. Okay, so in particular, we share with a uh, Psi, which is a uh, maxima in tango state, okay? And then for Alice, I say for Alice, I call the local PT, means that locally there's a non hermitian system. Okay, so as you can see here, for Alice, yeah, uh, there's evolution, but you know, by the U, there's some kind of measurement. Okay, there's A plus or min minus. And for Bob, okay, so he does not do, uh, he, he, he did nothing, okay, for Bob. And the idea is, okay, we can apply called the no signaling principle. So what's called the no signaling principle? The no signaling principle is, okay, uh, for Bob, the probability, as you can see the final, the probability in the Bob should remain the same or remain unaffected by Alice if Alice only choose the local measurement. Okay, so there's the outcome that if you sum over all the possible outcome for, for an Alice, okay, by the small a, the probability distribution in Bob's side should be the same. Okay, so again, I use this uh, two by two Hamiltonian, and then I just remind you again, this two by two Hamiltonian uh, is a Hermitian when alpha is zero, is non-Hermitian when alpha is non zero, and we have a U here, which is not a unitary, okay, but it's U, you can easily find. So what we can do is, uh, as I say, we prepare the initial state, Psi, which is the integral state, with Alice and Bob. 
So for Bob, I only apply the identical matrix means for Bob, he does not do anything. And then for Alice, I apply the U, you see before, there's a U defined by the time evolution operator, and she applied the measurement. Okay, so in particular, she applied the uh, sigma Y, a plus Y, a minus Y measurement. And then I sum over all the output. Okay, but you see the probability distribution in Bob's side is modified when alpha is non-lethal. Oh, when here alpha is related to, to, to uh, cosine alpha is defined, uh, cosine epsilon is defined as an alpha. Okay, so it means the, as you can see that the, the local PT symmetry violates the no signaling principle. Okay, so in at that time, uh, as I say, almost uh, yeah, seven years ago, we say, okay, if you look at this alternative quantum theory, you should be more careful. As I say, yeah, um, yeah. So that's what we did at that time, and then very quickly, the group in the USTC in China they realized this, yeah, by experimental invest investigation or with the open system. Okay, yeah. So let me come back to to uh, as point out by Professor Das on this non emission Hamiltonian. So you know because H is not the same as H taker. So we need to deal with not only a single eigenstate, but two families. Okay, one is right and the other one is left. Okay, and actually such kind of left and right eigenstate, they form the bi orthogonality we need to, uh, to deal with. Okay, so in short, instead of, for example, for the two by two matrix, it's not only, you know, Two vectors for for the right. Actually, there should be a, another two vectors for the left. We need to deal with. Okay, so that's called the Neyman dilation. Okay, so here, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, to do the dilation. I means uh, to expand the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian two and Hermitian one. Okay, by considering the left and right eigenvalues. Okay. So let's uh, example uh, for for the two by two Hamiltonian. Okay, you need to you know to do the dilation and then to find the, the solution. Okay, so so I just use this one uh, as a example. Yeah, if you like, you can have a look at this uh, more generalized one with the time dependent. So once again here, I consider the H as a PD symmetric Hamiltonian. Okay, so which can be time dependent or time independent in general. And what I want to do is to dilate H into a Hermitian one. But as I say, I'm we are familiar with the Hermitian system. Okay, so in short, I want to find a, a for example, if H is a two by two, I want to find a four by four uh, Hermitian operator. I denote by the H head. So they are H one, H two, H two taker, H four. Okay. So what I want to do is, uh, as you can see, I follow the uh, Schrodinger's equation, okay? So there's I per side head, okay? That means uh, there's a, a partial, partial T, a T derivative, okay? So we know this equal to H, but I can construct the H1, H2 with the, the help of the, the tau, okay? So if I define this tau oh, by, by changing it to i plus I tau take tau as a e down. So in short, because h is not the same as h take, but I can find a, I call the matrix. Okay, there's a matrix e down, which you can link them together. Okay, so with this e down, I can perform the dilation. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's what we did with the Hermitian, uh, non Hermitian system. I should say pseudo Hermitian, yeah, precisely. Okay, so if you like, you can have a look at this uh, paper in the journal of physics. Yeah, there's a, so the, uh, the idea is uh, we need to find the eta. Okay, not only for two by two, but we can have this eta for in general for the uh, n by n for the finite dimension. So in short, there's a, the matrix operator eta, which can guarantee H taker eta equal to. E down H, okay. 
And surprisingly, we can do this not only for real eigenvalue of the uh, unbroken PD symmetry, but also for broken PD symmetry. Okay. Uh, if and only if the eigenstate forms a complex conjugate pairs. Okay. So we, with this idea that I say I have H1, as I show you many times, yeah, for many times there's a non Hermitian Hamiltonian. But I perform the dilation for this H1. Okay, so there's a two by two to four by four. And then I, here we have eigen energy E plus minus, okay, as I showed before, which is real. But in terms of four by four space, I know I can apply the arbitrary rotation. Okay, because there's a unitary, yeah, there's a, there's a Hermitian, so I can apply arbitrary unitary, yeah, uh, operation for this four by four. And then I reduce everything into the two by two. So as you can see here, I can have not only H1, but also H2, H3, H4, H5, H6, all of them have the same eigen energy, which is real, as I write down here. And moreover, this H1 to H6, all of them are non Hermitian operators. And moreover, as you can see, in particular, for example, for H2, the matrix element is no longer complex numbers. They are only real numbers. Okay, but of course, they, you know, there are some uh, asymmetric components, yeah. So to, as a simple illustration, I can show you here. So what I showed before is two by two. So here I use the left and right. So I have two more, A and B. So in the very beginning, we have the coupling. As I, I here I use the, the arrow. So from the left to the right, okay, which are the same. And then in the, in the left, I use the red color to denote the, the game, okay, because it's I sign alpha. Then for the right, I use the green color to denote the lows. So when I say there's a game equal to lows, okay, uh, there's a, the typical PD symmetry in Aptis. But as you can see in for H2, I can have the PD symmetric Hamiltonian without the game and lows. So we means without the red color or green color. But at this time, I need to break the symmetry for the coupling. Because when I say game in the left, it means there should be a, a, a flow from the left to the right, from the game to the lows. So here, as you can see, the arrow from the left to the right become large. Okay, so effectively, as I say, I would say this effective Hamiltonian is the same as the previous one with uh, imaginary numbers. Okay. Okay, so I, I very quickly illustrated the dilation and why you can use this dilation to generate or to, to find the passive PD symmetric couple without the game and nodes. Okay, so based on the same methodology, yeah, we can deal with the broken, okay? So I just use a, a simple cartoon to illustrate what we did. Professor Lee? Yeah? <laughs> Just to uh, just to remind you for the arrow of time, uh, we have another talk at five thirty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe we can have a small time for questions from the yes, students. Yes. So how long? Uh, in, uh, how long? I, have? I think uh, I think you have like ten minutes. Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, roughly I, I can finish it all in ten minutes. Okay. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here I just uh, show you. Yeah. Uh, give the idea how you can deal with the yeah the broken. So yeah, as I say, for the Hermitian system, for the unbroken PD Hamiltonian, there's until now this is what I say is that you can apply the find the eigenstate, we can function, we can flow as well as the dilation. And the corresponding measurement is a minimum measurement. Okay, you need to you have the real eigenstate, the real eigenvalue in in the in, in for the eigenstate. On the other hand, if the uh, broken, if the PD image is broken, you, instead of the minimum measurement, you need to apply the weak uh, measurement. 
Okay, because right now the eigenvalue is no longer real, but with the weak measurement, you can perform the, you know, the amplification of the signal. So it means uh, you can have a compass number in the measurement. Okay, and as I said before, such kind of dilation can be applied not only to unbroken, but also the broken PD symmetry. So what we did, yeah, uh, two years ago is uh, you can apply the same idea in particular for the pseudo Hermitian into a large, uh, by embedding this into a large Hermitian system. Okay, so you can simulate the broken uh, Hamiltonian, but you need to apply the weak measurement. Okay, so that, that's the, the essential idea. And all the detail you can find in the paper. And what I want to point out is that with such kind of uh, pseudo Hermitian in the broken phase, you can have the quantum sensing, okay, or to invest the, the quantum state distinguishability, okay. Yeah, if you like, you can see the following papers by, uh, by these two groups in, in China. Okay, so uh, I'll come to my last topic. Yeah, in the, in, very quickly, uh, let me see. Uh, okay, so yeah. Uh, okay, so once again, I want to use this uh, cartoon to, to illustrate. Uh, well, so we know, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I closed this one. Okay, so in the yeah, uh, violation of no signaling principle, I use Alice and Bob. Okay, but I want to uh, propose another scenario. Okay, so instead of uh, uh, state shares, uh, share between Alice and Bob, I want to use uh, to, to in introduce another scenario which in which the Hamiltonian is shared between Alice and Bob. So the story is this, in terms of dilation we know, okay, we can effectively realize a PD symmetric system, okay, to you know, by using a, a global Hermitian system. Okay, so that's a, yeah, uh, what we know by the dilation. But however, if we only know the global Hermitian Hamiltonian, okay, so we only know this is a Hamiltonian is a Hermitian, how can we know whether it's a dilated one and which it should be useful for simulation, or which is just a, you know, a standard uh, non, uh, standard Hermitian one or the classical one. Okay, so, so to answer this question, as I say, we consider the problem of how to extract the internal non-locator T, okay. Yeah, so I just remind you about the CHSH scenario. Okay, so in which that's the, idea the inequality to test the non-locality. So we have a state shared by Alice and Bob, and for Alice and Bob, they perform the local measurement denoted by capital A and capital B with different basis. So as you can see here, for the cache code, we know this uh, joint measurement, or called the bare measurement, uh, should be smaller or equal than two for all the case called scenario. But for the quantum, we know we can have the possibility for this expectation value uh, for the joint measurement, which is a two times square root of two is larger than two. Okay, so it means there's an unlocality yeah, in this uh, in this shared quantum state. So we, we as I say, we, we, we uh, we, we propose a similar idea, but right now there's a shear by the global hermeticity. So what I mean is uh, we have a global system which is shared by Alice and Bob. But as I showed before, yeah, when alpha is zero, there's a Hermitian system. And we can also have a classical picture, okay? And when alpha is not zero, there's a PDC image. Okay, so we perform this uh, similar idea about the CHSH measurement, okay, for S. And then the results say, okay, if you have a Hermitian system, as well as a cage core system, this value, this joint measurement 
is bounded by, you know, as I show here, there's a, is bounded by this value. Okay, so when alpha equals one is bounded by two s. However, if you have a long Hermitian system, this value is bounded by a smaller value because it's a cosine square alpha. And moreover, this value becomes zero when we approach this uh, exceptional point. Okay, yeah, so let's come to my summary. Yeah. Okay, so uh, today I show you how to start the, the coexistence of uh, Hermitian quantum mechanics and, and PT quantum mechanics. So you know there's a yeah, no signaling principle we violate. Okay, so there's no consistent way if you only apply the local PT symmetry on uh, one of the entangled pairs. Okay, so with the dilation, I show you how to yeah, we, even though it's very quickly, but uh, conceptually how to simulate, uh, okay, for the unbroken as well as the broken PD symmetry. And I also show you how to extract the internal non-locality, okay, if you only have a global hermeticity. Nevertheless, uh, what I want to say is, uh, yeah, for the PD symmetric system, yeah, which should be, you know, very interesting model for open system or in the case called Limiter. So when I say classical limiter means uh, as an effective model, okay? So by embedding the PD symmetry into a large Hamiltonian, okay, either with a weak measurement or the Mandelman measurement, yeah, such kind of uh, dilation scenario can give you a new light on the study of PD symmetry quantum mechanics and its physical implications and applications, okay? So let me come to the, the last slide. Uh, so for me, until now, there are still many questions, yeah? For example, what's the fundamental yeah, origin of a PD image? Until now, as I say, I'm talking about models. As I say, when I say models, I have a Hamiltonian, but which was, uh, you know, with the long hermeticity put by hand. So what should be the fundamental meaning for this? Okay, I show you how to deal with the coexistence between the traditional one, the non Hermitian one. I show you how to deal with the broken and unbroken. However, we don't know how to have a smooth or closing for this exceptional point. We know how to do for the broken as well as for the unbroken, but we don't know how to close this yeah, smoothly. Moreover, we know there should be some entanglement in the PD symmetry, okay? Because you know there's a symmetry is a, as I say, is a constraint. That means there are some kind of correlation in the subsystem. But nevertheless, as I say, I don't know what is the the origin of this it is entanglement. Of course, as an effective model, there are many papers talking about uh, Bailey phase as well as the generalized black voice scheme modes in the PD image, but uh, I should say that's uh, an effective model. If you like, yeah, there are a big society about the PD symmetric quantum mechanics, uh, how to, you know, they are extend the standard quantum mechanics uh, as well as the uh, five four theory and quantum gravity. But as I said, there are model, yeah. So yeah, with this, I like to, yeah, thank you for your attention. Okay. okay, thanks, Professor Lee, for this very exhaustive, you know, the very wonderful talk. And you know, it really exhausted most of the frontier of probably the PT symmetric world and the research which is going on now. Thanks a lot. So uh, I think we are very hard pressed for time right now because the next talk is scheduled now. So maybe I'll take one question. Uh, Professor Utpal Roy has some question and rest of the questions can be maybe emailed to you. Okay. Hey, sorry, yeah. sorry, you yes. can have a couple of more questions, not a problem. I can no. have, it's okay. Yeah. We can take some time. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, fine. Um, Utpal, can you please uh, you. ask? Yeah, yeah. So thank you for, you know, very interesting talk. You know, I have a couple of questions actually. Uh, so uh, uh, for, you know, PT symmetry harmonic oscillated system, like once you mentioned that uh, the the it is not, you know, satisfying Heisenberg algebra, like AA dagger commutator is one. But then uh, we can have a combination, linear combination of these operators to make another one, right? 
So if that is so, uh, can we uh, kind of map this PT symmetric system to a deformed algebra? Can I say that they will follow a nonlinear deformed algebra and then the system completely goes to that uh, algebraic uh, uh, space? Do you want uh, to comment or something? Yeah, so for the deformed algebra, I, I think so, mathematically, yeah, it should be possible to do late. Yeah, so uh, there will be uh, more terms, uh, which is a function of a dagger square, a square, and also the function of a dagger a, in addition to one. Yeah. Uh, so then let me say this way. Yeah, uh, I personally, I think it should be possible to do that. But the problem, as I mentioned, is uh, what should be the corresponding, yeah, physical picture or the, yeah, because not only the algebra or not only the state, you need to have a, a consistent way in terms of this PT quantum mechanics. Okay, mm -hmm. so the problem actually I do not mention too much is uh, about the first of all you need to define the inner product. Okay, so mm -hmm. for example, for this case, the inner product is not only the PT, but you also need to introduce the the charge. Okay, the, actually the CPT. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then of course, uh, let, let me say this way. In terms of PT quantum mechanics, you can have a consistent way if you define everything is a non-hermitian or pseudo-hermitian. But there it is the problem. If you know a small part is a, that's what we point out is a coexistence between the non-hermitian or the between the pseudo-hermitian and the standard or the traditional quantum mechanics. So we don't know how to, uh, no, how to, uh, how to correct this problem. Mm. Okay. Right. So, so let, let me say the other way. You can have a mathematical formula for all the PD Hamiltonian or for PD quantum mechanics. But the problem is if you need to in, encounter or you need to yeah, deal with the traditional one, yeah, there are some things change. Okay. okay. So, so thank you. So the, the next thing is that uh, uh, in the beginning plot, you know, you have mentioned that uh, uh, this is for uh, zero and positive uh, epsilon, right? So uh, if you take a negative integer values, you know, that will uh, give you to a series of terms, which is in you know, X. So that can also lead to a system like uh, Rigbach atom, hydrogen atom. So is that is there any case of those kinds? Like, you know, you take the fraction and like, I don't know, but I believe they should be... Because once know. you mentioned some reference yeah. in Rigbach atom, so how, how do you get that kind of energy because that is one upon n square kind of thing? Uh, I, I don't have the answer. Okay, okay. So no problem. Yeah. Yeah. I was just maybe, wondering. Yeah, that. you can write it to me. I, I, can. Okay. I don't have an so, answer at this stage. Yeah? Just, just one more thing because I'm skipping two questions. Maybe I'll get in touch with you later on. But one very crucial thing I want to know that now, there are quantum systems which evolve. First of all, this is non-unitary evolution operator, which will be like a system will be governed by. Uh, and then uh, uh, two things here, like uh, the energy, which are quadratic function of quantum number, nonlinear spectrum. So this uh, those systems always lead to very interesting phenomena. So do you expect the similar things if you even ex uh, explain the system by PT symmetric uh, approach? Yeah, I think it should be similar. Because, so, so because yeah. anyway, you are changing the form of the, the eigenfunction is changed. Then, yes. uh, yeah, so, but you are representing by, again, real energy, like eigenvalues, right? Yes. yes. So, uh, will there be also a quadratic function of the quantum number again? So, that's the thing. That's the mm. point where one, one needs to think about. And then how long the time evolution is valid? Like, is it yeah. for indefinite time or there is some limit of the time for which one can study? So, yeah, yeah. So, so I should say that, uh, as I mentioned here, right now, for me, okay, PD Hamiltonian is an effective Hamiltonian. So, effectively, if you look, yeah, something like uh, evolution time or something, which becomes very strange because you only look at a reduced subsystem or subspace. 
but by the dimension, you can have a global view for the permission system for what we know. Okay, so for that case, you should know what should be the corresponding. There should be some kind of ancilla state, okay, which link uh, this uh, reduced space to. And in particular, for the for the case I show for the spin flip, the corresponding ancilla state uh, refer to the post measurement. So actually, it's not only the you know the the fast. Uh, uh, spin fleet per ton. Actually, the price you need to pay is the is the probability for this uh, projection, which becomes very small. So there, it is a, a trade-off between these. Okay. So I believe that should be doable. If yeah, as I say, if you look everything by the dilation, and then which should be have for uh, ancilla and uh, reduce the PD Hamiltonian, and then which can give you a, a more clear physical uh, interpretation. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank, so, you, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Are there, so there are some questions on the chat box. Uh, would you like to take them? Okay, so there's one question about from the Salon, yeah? So is yeah. it a mathematical uh, consistent that uh, on one qubit, we are using a PD image Hamiltonian, and on other, we are considering normal quantum mechanics. What about the inner product structure? We are modifying the uh, on Alice's part, and one qubit, the inner product is defined by CPT, while the other is just compass conjugate, okay, and transpose it. Okay, so, okay, so as I say, if you consider standard quantum mechanics combined with the PD Hamiltonian, there's no way you can get rid of the, the problem as I show you the no signaling principle. And as, yeah, as I mentioned, as already pointed out here, the inner product, yeah, you need to pay attention. Okay, so in, in short, uh, in terms of mathematics consistent, there's no way to do that. Unless everything is uh, is non hermitian okay. So if you have uh, one is a traditional, one is PT, there it is problems. Okay. In a uh, sense, for, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, what you're saying is that given the quantum world, I can mm -hmm. erect a perfect image which is PT symmetric by mapping each operator, each observable to the PT symmetric world. But once I have a PT symmetric world, the physical measurements which I do in real world, they will look like nonsense or they will become very weird. I mean, yeah, yeah, uh, very yeah, weird, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah, as I say, actually, by dilation, you can clear, clear see the, you know, the correlation or the link between these two qubits. Okay, yeah. So actually, as I say, uh, let's uh, actually, the PD Hamiltonian, what I can say is an effective model. Okay, effective model means if you do the dilation, you have a global view, and then everything should be, you know, it should be uh, follow the same uh, same mathematical structure. Otherwise, there is very real or very strange. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Professor Panigrahi, do you want to make any comments or? No, no. I actually I read Professor Lee's papers. And I will send you some of our work. Wonderful talk. An amazing amount of experiment and theory you people have done. You know, amazing, you know, amount of work. Truly enjoyable. I'll get back to you. I'll read this, your papers and I'll send you some of our works also. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. okay. So with that, we would like to thank you. And, uh, thank, thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Okay. And we conclude this talk here, and uh, then uh, I hand over the stage to Professor Panikai. Okay. So thank, thank you, you Professor Lee. Okay. And we'll be in touch. Okay. Yeah. Sure. 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 Definitely. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I saw there one more. Question in, in the chat. Do I need to apply or reply? 
maybe I can request the person to uh, to write to you and, and okay, whoever okay. has questions, oh, read they it should out. just read, read it out. Read it out. Okay, okay, so there's a last okay. question there by somebody called Sarang. Yeah, so you can go ahead. Okay, okay. So the question is about the uh, let me show you the quantum state tomography. What does the reconstruction algorithm? Okay, so in very short, we uh, as I show here. Okay, so here we apply two approach. One is the much more likely who estimation. So we try to you know estimate the, the probability distribution. But at the same time, we also develop the machine learning technology by the convolution neural network. So the idea is uh, we train the machine, okay, by feeding all the possible data, including the you know different level of squeezing, different thermal noise, and then automatically the machine can recognize the pattern. Okay, for example, uh, corresponding to what kind of the density matrix. Okay, so this is some kind of machine learning technology, yeah. Okay, so maybe I just have a last curiosity if there is time. I mean, yeah, yeah. can you tell us what was, so you proposed something for this gravitational wave which kind of is supposed to enhance its accuracy. Can you comment yeah. once more, what was the, what is it that you used to enhance? It's not clear, I mean, how did the okay, signal okay. became better? Okay, okay, so uh, maybe I go too fast. So the idea is, okay, as you can see here in the gravitational wave detector, we have many uh, technical noises. And the idea is that for, for example, uh, as I show here for advanced LIGO, we suffer from the radiation pressure noise in the lower frequency. And the, in the high frequency, we suffer from the called phase noise, okay, so, it means uh, in terms of uh, detector, there are two kinds of uh, noises we need to deal with. One is called the strong noise, means mm -hmm. uh, the photon number fluctuation, okay? But I said there's a due to the Poisson distribution of the, the noise function. And the other one is the phase un uncertainty, okay? So we need to squeeze the this uncertainty by introducing the, uh, the screen state so the idea is we can inject the squeeze state into the cavity to replace the, the vacuum. I see, I see, yeah, okay. Yeah. And the technical problem is in terms of, as I show here, all this report in the in the field, that the synopsis say in terms of lower frequency, as you can see that the pink color, we need to suppress the amplitude noise. Okay, because they, 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 uh, in terms of high frequency, like the green color, we need to reduce the phase noise because the response of the detector is not a constant. The response of the detector is a frequency dependent. And then we need to rotate the angle of the squeezing for lower frequency region for higher frequency region. And technically how to do that is to inject the, the, the squeeze not only to the detector, okay, but to the field cavity first. And the field cavity is uh, uh, typical right now for LIGO and the Virgo is uh, uh, 300 meter long. Okay, mm -hmm. so by this, you can rotate the angle of squeezing. So this is what they say called the feeding the squeezing at all frequencies. Okay. I see. So by by putting in the appropriate squeezed state there, you think that over the full frequency range, you can kind of uh, reduce yeah, yeah. the. I see. Yeah, I sure, sure, sure. So first, uh, you prepare. We call a frequency independent squeezing. The squeezing injection into the detector, but before later, you need to do the rotation called a frequency dependent squeezing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, Professor Panigray, is there? Yeah, we yes, thanks, uh, yeah. Dr. Lee, one yes absolutely. Yeah, many, many thanks for the wonderful talk, and yeah. we stay in touch. Yeah. Okay, so I will stop here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all for for the uh, attention, and yeah, thank you for the invitation. Okay. Okay. See you soon. See you soon. Yeah. See you. See you sometime soon. Yeah. yeah thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay.
Intro, are you around? Intro yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, I am available. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hi, how are you? It was a wonderful talk by Professor Lee. Yeah, yeah. So now we have a bit late, but it's okay because it was so spontaneous and uh, so many questions were answering. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Dintoman Joy. I think if I remember correctly, I met Dinto first yes. in Pusat in the yes. student canteen. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you still remember? Okay. No, he, he, he finished his PhD from Pusat in quantum science and technology. And then now he's a postdoc in ISO Tirupati. And we have interacted and have some papers together. He has actually not only good understanding of quantum information and quantum computation, but he you know, has a hands on experience with IBM also. Now, um, you know, one, one thing I noticed that, uh, you know, if you look at quantum science, the most fundamental contributions to all branches, including the coherence, is from none other than George Larson. And, uh, you know, laser, coherent state, intensity, intensity correlation, P function, open quantum system, weak measurement, you call it and you know, everywhere, George Larson had, had a contribution. So I noticed one thing, and it's such a pleasure to notice, all the four speakers are from the land of George Larson, namely Kerala. Quantum science is doing well. So now the first speaker is Dr. Dinto Banjar. Dinto, yes, sir. you can start. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah, I will share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yeah, we can see. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for uh, remembering the first time we met and everything. I never expected that. Um, uh, I'm also, you know, very privileged uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, you know, participate in this uh, summer school. Uh, and I thank the, all the organizers, especially Professor Panigraji. Uh, for inviting me for this talk. Um, okay, I will begin my presentation. Okay. Uh, the screen is visible, right? Properly. Uh, there is no problem, right? Yeah, the screen is clearly visible. Hello? Yeah, am I audible? I thought um, there is yeah, internet. Yeah, you're audible, but just a bit of lag. Okay. Okay, uh, let me know if, if there is any problem with my uh, on my side. Okay. Uh, now I am, uh, now we can uh, start the uh, discussion. Okay, today uh, we are going to uh, discuss about a topic uh, called Secure quantum communication using quantum teleportation. Um, I specifically chose this topic because uh, this this topic was of very much uh, interest to me in uh, during my PhD time. Uh, currently, I am working as a postdoctoral fellow in uh, ISAP Tirupati. Uh, we are working in quantum simulation. Um, yeah, with this, I will move on to the talk. Uh, yeah, I won't uh, during the, in this talk, I won't be telling much about the basics because it is already covered in most of the talks and uh, I won't spend much time on introduction. And then we will spend some time on quantum teleportation and quantum then quantum cryptography, uh, what is the progress in this area. And then we will move on to a specific uh, a technique uh, in quantum cryptography called deterministic secure quantum communication. And uh, we will, there as per the, uh, topic, uh, we will specifically focus on uh, this technique using quantum teleportation and then uh, summarizing. Okay, so the first question is uh, what arises is why we need uh, a secure quantum communication. Now, what is the problem with our uh, current uh, communication scheme, uh, whether the uh, encryption or this security is there, is there any fault with our security? Uh, the problem actually exists. Uh, it exists in the idea that uh, the security of our uh, current encryption protocols are based on the computational complexity, uh, which means that uh, 
the in unavailability of some efficient uh, algorithms, classical algorithms, uh, is what we are dependent on for security. So, in the future, uh, uh, that is what uh, showed, Peter showed, uh, showed in, uh, in, his, in his paper. Uh, he developed a, an algorithm for factorizing numbers uh, in polynomial time. Uh, there is uh, not such, uh, there is no, um, uh, there is no equivalent or any uh, comparable uh, efficient algorithms in uh, conventional computing. Okay, so uh, most uh, mostly in for our uh, encryption scheme, currently we are using uh, RSA algorithm uh, named after the authors, uh, Rivas, Shamir, and Edelman. Uh, the idea is it, it is a public key crypto cryptographic scheme. Uh, the idea is basically uh, we have a message which is a plain text, and uh, we will encrypt that message using a public key. Uh, this is some integer n. And Alice is the sender, so she encrypts this message and uh, converts it into a cipher text. And this cipher text uh, is passed on to uh, the receiver. Uh, receiver will decrypt the message using a private key P and Q. Uh, the relation between P Q, the private key, and the public key is that uh, there's the product of P Q is the uh, number n. So if you know P and Q, you can decrypt this message and then recover the uh, original message, plain text. Okay, but here the security, you know, all uh, banking and every everywhere, uh, this RSA algorithm are used mostly. And uh, the security is based on the fact that there is no efficient classical algorithm to factorize uh, P and Q, this number N, and find this these numbers P and Q. So that is the, idea of uh, uh, security in our current uh, encryption method. But the, as, we, as it is shown by show that uh, a fully developed quantum computer can uh, factorize these numbers and uh, in polynomial time and uh, thereby this will be, a, uh, we can tell it is a threat to uh, our conventional uh, current encryption scheme. And also another uh, nagging factor is that uh, we can always uh, copy a information, uh, this classical information, even if it is encrypted, we can copy them passively. That means the sender, even the sender doesn't know whether somebody had copied or not, or a, the receiver also, they won't know whether somebody had copied this information or not. So the eavesdropper can copy the information and process it using some powerful device uh, to decrypt the information. So these are the problem uh, with our conventional computers. Uh, so we are trying to find a, a solution to this problem uh, to, for, to, for this security using uh, quantum uh, quantum mechanics with the properties of uh, quantum mechanics. Okay. So next, uh, I am try telling you the basic uh, because we have to be on uh, verify that we are on the same page. Uh, so I will just uh, skip through this. Uh, uh, this uh, Unlike these conventional computers, where uh, we have zero and one state, in quantum bits, we have uh, this superposition state is possible. So alpha zero plus beta one is a arbitrary, uh, it's a state of an arbitrary single qubit. Single qubit, okay. So uh, if there are more qubits, then uh, we will write tensor product of them. Uh, mathematically, they are represented by these column matrices, and uh, this uh, subscript you know, uh, denotes the labels corresponding to the each qubit. Uh, the separable states are usually uh, the state, uh, the qubits which have a well-defined wave function. So that is what we call separable states. And uh, if it doesn't have a well-defined um, state, then we will call them entangled states. Uh, these are all, uh, yeah, most of the students might know, uh, these are all uh, the quantum gates. It's a, some of the quantum gates are given here. This is a uh, general, uh, Single qubit k, and this uh, at the third column shows the circuit representation, where each line shows the timeline of each qubit, which means what happens to that qubit after some time. And these are the two qubit gates, which most of you know how it works. So I'm skipping through that. And uh, 
this is a quantum circuit for a preparation of uh, two particle entangled state called bell basis state and for a uh, different values of input zero and different values of input uh, it will give different entangled state okay now we will move on to uh, the main uh, topic main area of interest in this discussion uh, we are going to discuss quantum teleportation and i am sure that most of you know uh, what quantum teleportation is uh, here i am giving you uh, just a brief idea um, for those who still uh, have some uh, problem with this understanding this okay, okay here uh, in this di schematic diagram you can see there are uh, actually there are three qubits uh, one is called one is colored pink uh, another one is gray and another is blue here uh, gray and blue are entangled photons and uh, the photon p the pink color photon is uh, the state of which is what we the alice alice wants to uh, teleport to bob so she uses a bell state analyzer uh, to make bell measurements between the pink and gray photon and uh, the results are uh, sent to bob as a classical bit using that bit uh, the receiver will uh, do some transformation operation and he will recover the pink photon here okay uh, this is a schematic idea and uh, the quantum circuit representation is shown here uh, here you can see that uh, uh, what are the resources uh, we are using in quantum teleportation is uh, entanglement channel uh, this to get uh, clear tells about the entanglement channel and the measurement basis uh, classical bits uh, this double lines represent uh, classical information and the single line represent the qubit uh, still has the uh, quantum information and uh, the quantum gates and uh, extra qubits uh, the ancillary qubits these are the resources uh, overall we use it. it is used in quantum teleportation uh, as you know the scheme is uh, introduced by uh, bennett and bennett uh, in uh, 1993 and almost all quantum teleportation schemes uh, proposed after that uh, what they change what uh, the difference is that only the quantum state uh, entanglement channel and the measurement basis or uh, all these things will change uh, but the idea remains the same uh, as it was originally proposed from uh, bennett okay uh, we will have to move a little bit on the mathematical part also because this is not a, this is just a two step uh, two or three step idea uh, this the mathematics is really simple um, the initial state of uh, these three photons is given by uh, alpha zero plus beta one which is the state of uh, pink photon and uh, these two are the gray uh, gray and blue are the state of entangled particles uh, you we write the uh, product state we write them as a product and then uh, what we are going to do is uh, we will group them uh, group p and g uh, this pink and gray photons the state of them uh, and uh, separate this state of uh, blue photon so we will get a state like this. Uh, so far, we haven't done any physical operation or anything on this state. We have just regrouped it. And then we are expressing the state of pink and gray photons in terms of bell basis. So that's what we do in the next step. Uh, this pink and gray photon state are expressed in terms of bell basis state and then regrouped again. So now after this regrouping, we, we can see that uh, state of um, the blue photon will change depending on the uh, state of this pink and gray photon okay now we can see there are uh, four uh, the, this uh, state of uh, this three particles are in the superposition of these four states uh, they which are equally probable okay uh, so far there is no uh, we haven't done any gate operation or anything just regrouping and rewriting it in terms of bell basis so that's this is what we get and if we are we get a uh, uh, make a bell measurement on p and g pink and gray photon uh, this system will collapse into one particular state uh, in any of these states with equal probability so if it's uh, collapsed to this particular pi plus state then uh, the uh, blue photon will be in uh, alpha zero plus beta one state which is the state uh, originally we wanted to teleport so uh, the result of uh, measurement measurement result of this uh, qubits are sent to the receiver uh, using this classical bits so each classical bit will correspond to some 
operation as a unitary operation and the, the receiver will perform this particular operation. So this is what happening only after the measurement, everything will collapse and uh, the receiver will make some operation uh, to recover the state. So uh, in this process, one thing we have to notice is that uh, the receiver is not aware of, uh, need not be aware of uh, which quantum channel uh, is shared to him. He need not uh, bother about that, bother about that. Um, the classical bit, you just have to make uh, operations based on the classical information. So this is one uh, property and specifying here because we are going to uh, use it in a, uh, show it in a, that is useful in a one of our work. That's what we are going to show later. Okay. Uh, so other variants of this uh, teleportation protocol, there are a lot of variants and uh, more specifically the interesting ones are uh, the probabilistic teleportation where uh, in this previous case, uh, we have seen perfect teleportation scheme. Uh, in probabilistic scheme, uh, the channel is not perfect. Um, so it is a noisy channel, it may be partially entangled state. So that is what we see in probabilistic teleportation. Uh, in controlled teleportation, uh, instead of uh, two people, uh, here we saw a receiver and sender and receiver, but in controlled teleportation, there will be a third person called controller. So only if the controller allows, then there will be the, uh, the teleportation will work. So that kind of uh, situation, that's just a variant of teleportation. And the entanglement swapping, uh, here uh, instead of teleporting in unknown state, uh, we will be teleporting in entangled state. So that is what we see in entanglement swapping. Uh, quantum information splitting, uh, we can uh, split information uh, between uh, different users uh, and uh, it basically uses the uh, teleportation uh, in, in this uh, process. And quantum dialogue is where uh, two people can simultaneously do uh, teleportation. The receiver will send a message to Bob and Bob will simultaneously send a message to uh, receiver, which is a, a reasonable variation. And uh, a remote state uh, tele preparation uh, where we will uh, try to assemble a known state in a particular location uh, using the same method, uh, the same idea of teleportation. Uh, but the problem here, uh, in mainly in quantum teleportation, is that uh, realizing it is a base, mostly based on the Bell state measurement. If you are able to uh, um, realize it perfectly, then uh, it, uh, we can have successful teleportation. Okay, with this, we, will, we can move on to uh, what is the status of uh, quantum cryptography currently. Uh, initially, you now this is the in the figure you can see a classical cryptographic scheme. Uh, this is called one-time path scheme, which is uh, which is a very very secure uh, communication scheme. Uh, here, in, in, this is a very plain uh, idea. Uh, the message is encrypted using a, some secret key, and this ciphertext is sent to the receiver. And if he, he will decode the message, uh, only if he know the same secret key. So then he can decode the message. So the problem now uh, turns out to be that uh, how to share the secret key between Alice and Bob. Uh, if we are able to share the secret key between these two people, then uh, our, all our communication will be secure all the time. But the problem is there is no uh, perfect method to share this key, uh, share this key uh, securely. So that's why uh, Bennett and Prasad in a, 1984, they proposed a scheme uh, by, by using this uh, quantum properties to share this secret key. They used quantum properties to share the secret key securely between uh, sender and receiver. So that's where the area of quantum cryptography began. And then uh, later in 1991, uh, Eckhart et al. showed that uh, we can share the secret key using entangled states. Uh, so, but the later developments, you know, this quantum key distribution scheme uh, is what uh, gaining more traction uh, in now nowadays. Uh, there are uh, lots of works going on quantum key distribution networks, and uh, all over the world we see a lot of uh, development. Uh, but after this. Uh, quantum key distribution scheme, uh, there were some more uh, developments uh, where people tried to uh, develop uh, this uh, secure communication without uh, any uh, sharing this key. So that is the idea behind 
There's two for the almost similar kind of protocol called a deterministic secure quantum communication. The name is a little bit big, uh, but there is very little difference also between these two. Uh, the second one is quantum secure direct communication method. So here, uh, there is uh, no sharing of secret key. Instead, we are uh, encoding this classical information onto the qubit or some entangled particles. And then uh, we are using some techniques to transfer it securely. securely. So the difference between these two is uh, that in DSQC scheme, uh, we need uh, after now, when we in this process, uh, there will be error checking and uh, uh, eavesdrop checking process. There will, it will be there. Uh, for that, we need a classical information. But apart from that, uh, to decode a, a one bit of information, uh, decode a single qubit. This uh, DSQC needs an extra uh, one qubit of one bit of classical information. Uh, apart from the error checking process, the DSPC requests uh, one at least one classical bit of information per qubit. That is the only difference. Where in QSDC, you can uh, directly uh, decode the message. Uh, that is what, but that is the difference between these two, which I hope is clear now. Uh, if there is any, um, if, there is a question. Uh, yeah. So, what is the definition of a key? So, what is yeah. a key? Okay, uh, key is no, a, you give me a lock. Classically, if you give me a lock, I understand the key. So what is it? When yeah, it is a, just a random number. Uh, this key is random. The, um, we use this in, uh, random numbers to encrypt the given message. But which means it's a classical information. The key is a classical information. Yeah, it is a classical information. We are encoding uh, this classical data using a secret key. I see. And key in the, your all your strategy is necessarily a classical information, or key can itself be quantum. Um, uh, you know, we need a, a, a classical key, but we use uh, quantum methods to develop that key. That's all. I see. So that's yeah. the that's the conventional wisdom that you always. This is a yeah. classical information which you encode in a quantum way, but yeah. the information is classical which you are encoding, which you call the key. Yeah, the key is classical. Yeah, I see. Okay. but in order to get that key, we are using this uh, quantum methods. That's okay. the difference. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, there is one question: Is passive copying of information uh, related to phishing? Um, phishing. Okay. So what I meant here is that we can call. The information uh, because these are in a, uh, this uh, information is in, uh, physically in a device, so you can copy them. So that is what I meant. Uh, idea I am not clear about fishing. Okay, yeah, I will. If anyone can clear that, uh, I will try to answer. Okay, yeah, we will come back to that question again later. Okay. Okay, so uh, earlier we saw so, uh, in classical cryptography, the security is based on computational complexity. That is, uh, it, that is, it is based on uh, some the unavailability of classical algorithm, uh, efficient algorithm. But here, uh, the security of uh, these schemes are based on uh, the laws of physics. Uh, so this is, this cannot be. Uh, uh, insecure. Uh, there is there is a strong um, argument behind the security of these uh, schemes. Okay. Uh, first thing is uh, we know Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Um, in a normal classical in a normal communication, there will be only the classical channel is available. Uh, but in quantum communication, we have a quantum channel, extra channel. But it, there is always a possibility that uh, there will be an eavesdropper in the middle. So this sender Alice, uh, in quantum communication, she will use both classical and quantum channel. And uh, to, to uh, for Bob to decode this message, uh, he has to rely on uh, classical, in, classical information from Alice. So I will tell the detail in detail, in detail what are the process uh, techniques used in this secure quantum communication. And uh, another important factor here is that 
um, if the eavesdropper does not know in which basis Alice had encoded her message, then uh, he cannot gain any information by measuring this uh, qubits in the quantum channel. Okay, uh, so he cannot randomly just measure and get information. He has to know which basis he should measure. So that is uh, one advantage. Uh, he cannot uh, measure in all three uh, bases at the same time. Uh, means all two, uh, any two bases at the same time. Uh, that is prohibited. Uh, you cannot get because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And uh, in quantum no cloning theorem, uh, we see that uh, yeah, an unknown quantum state cannot be copied. So if Alice is sending some encoded information to Bob, this eavesdropper cannot make copies of that information. So that is another uh, plus point because uh, it avoids uh, passive copying. Okay, so nobody can passively copy uh, in, uh, some information and uh, escape. Because if they had uh, tried to uh, copy or do some operation on this qubit, then it can be detected by the receiver. So this is what may this is what. Uh, that makes uh, quantum communication uh, more secure than uh, our conventional communication scheme. Uh, here, uh, no, it is important. Uh, it is uh, important uh, to know what is no cloning theorem. Uh, I will just, it's just a two-step process. Uh, just two st steps are there. Uh, it is first proposed. Uh, it is just uh, first proved in uh, 1982 by Uters and Zurek. And they showed that an uh, unknown quantum state cannot be copied. Uh, so this example uh, I have taken from a textbook uh, by Ben and all, and most of you must know, might know this. Uh, here, suppose that there is some unitary operator which can actually copy the state uh, psi onto the second qubit phi, which is in the state phi. Okay. So after this operation, uh, if there exists a unitary operator, then it, there will be a copy on the second qubit. So then the Zero state can be copied onto phi, and uh, one state can be copied onto the next qubit. So it, we will like, get results like that. In that case, then uh, the unknown uh, single qubit state can be copied onto the second qubit D, and it should give a state like this. And the product of this state will have four terms. But in actual, actually, we, when we, uh, because of linearity property of uh, unitary operator, uh, they, we will get only two terms. Okay, so that's why it is, it is that's how it is proven that uh, it is impossible to copy uh, unknown single qubit state. This is a very simple uh, and elegant uh, mathematical proof for this no cloning theorem. So our security is all based on some uh, solid physics in this. Uh, yeah, it, it is basically it's fundamental thing. So now. Okay, uh, now we can move on to uh, what are the techniques we use in uh, in our this uh, secret communication scheme. Okay, uh, mo mostly uh, I am here focused on uh, deterministic secure quantum communication scheme that is called DSQC um, because uh, in this uh, type of scheme, um, even though it is a bit uh, costlier, uh, it may uses more resource, but uh, uh, the security uh, of uh, the security is important. So, uh, using this teleportation and the related uh, methods, the we can assure the security in all the communication. Okay, we will discuss some of them and uh, uh, in a, in detail also in the next slides. Okay, already I am uh, taking so much time, so I will go through the part quickly. So here usually we have this block transmission and order rearrangement method, uh, where um, this uh, I, this A and B are the uh, sender and receiver. So initially they will prepare uh, entangled states, and the uh, sender will encode some information on one of the qubit and uh, send that particular block uh, to their receiver. Okay, and uh, in this red uh, mark the. This color, red colored uh, qubits are decoy qubits, they, which they will use for uh, checking process. And uh, the receiver, after once he get the, uh, this block of qubits, he will check for uh, um, 
uh, this uh, error. And uh, if the error is minimum, then uh, they will uh, measure their qubits, their block of qubits. This this particular block, block is uh, with the receiver, and this particular block is with Bob. So they will individually, they will make single particle measurements. And uh, that result, they, uh, Alice, this uh, sender will publish her result, and uh, the receiver will compare that result and they use this met, uh, method to decode the information. This MA is the message sent by Alice. Okay, this is one uh, method here, but uh, our idea, interest is in uh, how do we, how to use quantum teleportation for this DSQP. And this is one example given by uh, Man et al. Uh, for using entanglement swapping, where uh, initially entangled uh, these two, A1 and B1 are in, in, entangled initially, A2 and B2 are initially entangled, and uh, some unitary operation is performed on A1 and A2 by the uh, sender. And uh, after uh, transmitting this uh, B, B sequence of particle to Bob, uh, the sender will perform Bell measurement on A1 and A2. So this will make B1 and B2 get uh, entangled. And uh, if the receiver measures it in the bell basis, then he will get to know uh, the information encoded by Alice initially. So that is the idea behind entanglement swapping. Um, and here in uh, quantum teleportation and entanglement swapping, all these things, uh, the security is established once the uh, channel is shared securely. And after that, uh, the information appears uh, disappears at one place at the sender's place and it re it appears at the receiver's place so there is no physical movement of information so that is what uh, it made makes it inter interesting uh, this quantum teleportation and related variants so the major challenge is only uh, establishing secure channel and performing a complete well state machine so this is one of the paper i will quickly go through um, here uh, we used a already proposed protocol by nandi et al uh, this is a protocol for a teleportation scheme for a two particle entangled state, two particle state uh, using a three particle state, uh, which is called a GHZ like state. And uh, here, this is the basis eta plus or minus and uh, zeta plus or minus for the basis used. And uh, what we did is uh, we prepared an almost similar kind of uh, teleportation scheme, but uh, it will teleport some different state. Uh, there, there is a tiny variation in the uh, state the entanglement channel and uh, teleportation teleported state uh, initially i told you uh, here the receiver need not uh, receiver or even the uh, eavesdropper they won't know about which entanglement channel is shared between them the only thing is uh, they will get some classical information and based on that they are asked to do some unitary operation that is all what they know and uh, so this freedom of a uh, sender he can choose uh, whichever channel, entanglement channel he wants, uh, nobody is going to know that. So we use that idea and uh, we superpose these two schemes. Uh, for this is first table is for uh, is from Nandi et al. scheme and second is for from our scheme. Uh, so you can see that classical bits are the same and the recovery operations are the same. Uh, only thing is uh, the deformed information that uh, Bob receives after Alice measurement uh, that changes. But uh, you, the receiver doesn't know, and uh, even the eavesdropper doesn't know uh, what state they are having. So we can uh, superpose them, and the sender can uh, uh, you know, share entanglement channel depending on the message he wants to uh, share. So that idea, we take, uh, we use that idea and uh, prepare a protocol. Uh, this is given in five steps, uh, which, uh, which is nothing but that uh, creating a tra block of uh, home qubits and uh, traveling qubits. Just, this is step is just to uh, establish a secure quantum channel. And after that, we will do error checking process and then teleportation. So that is uh, almost similar in uh, most of the protocol. There are tiny variations. Uh, but we calculate the e efficiency of a, uh, such a protocol using Cabello et al. definition, where uh, uh, beta L, B is, is the number of messages transmitted and uh, how much uh, quantum bits and classical bits we have used. Uh, that is in the denominator. So QT is the number of quantum bits and uh, BT is the number of classical bits used to decode the message. So we compared it with uh, other previously um, established 
uh, quantum teleportation schemes. And uh, we, we are able to show that uh, by superposing, we can, the efficiency of uh, the protocol is improving. So that is what we are saying. It is always less than 50 because uh, during error checking process, we will uh, uh, check half of the uh, shared entangled particles, entangled pairs uh, for error checking. So that's, uh, this is how we were able to develop an uh, efficient scheme. And uh, also to check that, we will use uh, uh, different quantum attacks called the measure and reset attack, intercept and reset attack. And I am not going through these attacks because um, the time is, we have very less time for that. Okay, uh, and coming to the QSB scheme, uh, uh, why the QSBC has uh, some problem, but it is, uh, this protocol is also gaining more attraction uh, than the DSQC, uh, that, that because there is no need for, a, um, and because the idea is, uh, this is much more simpler, but uh, we have to compromise on security. Uh, uh, the idea is, uh, the Bob uh, will, prepare uh, entangled particles, and then uh, one block of particles is sent to Alice. That's what's shown in this part. And uh, Alice will perform some operation uh, to qubit, some uh, unitary operation on these qubits, and uh, send it back to Bob. And Bob will make a bell measurement to recover the information. So uh, this is the idea, but uh, the problem here is that the information carrying uh, block is transmitted between uh, sender and receiver. So that is one problem in uh, DSQ, this QSBC protocol, um, which is, which can be avoided if you use quantum teleportation based scheme. Uh, but the problem is in quantum teleportation, uh, you use more resources. Uh, that is a problem in teleportation based scheme. Uh, but security is compromised in this here. Uh, this is one, uh, one of the QSBC scheme proposed by us. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, here we have used entanglement swapping and dense coding method to uh, develop this scheme, but I'm not going through this uh, detail. Uh, here in this, I will give a general idea that uh, in this scheme, there are uh, uh, multiple controllers are here. Uh, usually I told in control, tele we method use the control teleportation method. And uh, here there are multiple controllers and they only, if they, all of them allow these two users, Alice and Bob can communicate. So that is the idea behind this paper. And uh, uh, coming to the summary, um, in this DSQC scheme, which is based on uh, teleportation, uh, we have this message confidentiality, confidentiality uh, which means that uh, you, the message carrying qubit is not moving at all. Initially, once you establish a secure quantum channel, then you will make a teleportation, you will perform teleportation, and uh, the message will disappear at at least place and it will appear at the uh, box place. So the uh, message is confidential. So eavesdropper has no way of knowing that. Uh, but, but there are attacks uh, uh, called uh, entanglement attack in which if in the initial stage when uh, uh, this eavesdropper is able to connect one of his qubits using a C0 gate on the entangled particle, then uh, there is a chance that uh, the teleported state could go to that. Is trouble, but uh, that can be avoided uh, using the error checking process. And uh, another thing which we really want is a message authentication scheme that uh, after receiving this entangled set of particles, uh, the Bob will tell, tell some confirmation, some authentication. So uh, this kind of authentication uh, should be from, we should make sure it is from the uh, receiver. Uh, it could be from a uh, eavesdropper also. So those kind of uh, authentication schemes are also important. Um, so if we have both these two, uh, uh, this teleportation scheme has, a uh, based scheme has this message confidentiality, but uh, if it's other authentication schemes, then we have a completely, uh, perfectly secure uh, quantum cryptographic uh, secure communication. Okay, uh, a major challenge is always uh, the realization of bell state measurement. Uh, we should be able to uh, differentiate these four bell states uh, perfectly. And uh, developing this uh, DSQC protocols in a noisy quantum channel. Uh, so far, 
they have used perfect quantum channel, but uh, uh, noisy quantum channels are much more realistic. So that is very important. And for long distance communication, we need uh, quantum repeaters and quantum memory, uh, where memory in memories, we can store this information for some amount of time. And that kind of uh, research is important for a to enable long distance communication. But we know uh, already there are uh, uh, a satellite based quantum communication we have established and uh, uh, the quantum teleportation between uh, two ground stations, which are separated by 1400 kilometers can be active. And Panigre, uh, said, sir had uh, discussed all these things in, uh, in his talk. Uh, so yeah, most of you might all know all these things. So with this, uh, I'm ending my presentation here. Uh, so these are some of the uh, references I used. And uh, thank you all for listening to the talk. So thank you. Now some questions, you can yeah. edit them. Yeah. Sarah, can edit out? Yeah. yeah uh, why? Yeah. There is one question. Can I read? Shall I read it? Yeah, 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 yeah you can read. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. sure. yeah. Uh, why quantum system is uh, more secure than classical system? Yeah, that is why I told uh, there are two properties which I told. Uh, one is based on uh, quantum no cloning theorem, where you know it, it prohibits some eavesdropper from copying information. Uh, unknown quantum state cannot be copied. Uh, that is a, a you know fundamental truth, fundamental law of physics. Uh, that is one reason we cannot copy information. But in any quantum computers, we need to you know any computing device we need that. Uh, but uh, we can move it around. Uh, we cannot copy make copies of that. Okay. In the next next thing which I told is um, okay. Uh, uh, I'm telling answer for the first question that. Uh, why it is secure than classical system? Um, yeah, there's these two things: Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and uh, using quantum no cloning theorem, we can we can establish that it is more, much more secure than classical system uh, because there is no equivalent method in classical uh, classical way. Okay, have you observed changes in quantum capacity after installing DSPC protocol in quantum center? Um, Changes in quantum capacity. Okay. Yeah, that is what uh, in the efficiency using the efficiency parameter. Well, that is what we observe because uh, we are using lesser number of um, quantum bits and classical bits per a information shared uh, using uh, not all these PC protocol. Uh, we are telling about our protocol. I am telling about the protocol we proposed. And then we found that there is better efficiency, but uh, mostly uh, QSDC schemes are uh, efficient, much more efficiency uh, using some techniques uh, that I should. Yeah. Is there any more question? Uh, I think I, I hope I made it clear. Uh, if I have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah can you? Sir, uh, how we know uh, which algorithm is used in uh, uh, in a circuit for a particular operation such as addition, hmm. multiplication of qubits? Okay. Uh, addition, multiplication of qubits. Uh, I didn't understand that. Because how do you do that? Yeah, of course, sir. Uh, hello. Yes, uh, sir. Addition, addition and multiplication. Okay, you mean a normal addition and multiplication? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I uh, know uh, the, the idea here is um, for the addition and multiplication for those kind of uh, tasks. This uh, our conventional computers are far far better. Uh, they don't use much resource. But uh, here, uh, developing a qubit and um, it could be possible. It is possible, but uh, it will be difficult. Um, you know, it is co costlier to do an addition and subtraction th thing on a uh, quantum computer. We mo mostly the immediate applications will be in uh, quantum communication. That is what uh, a much more uh, rela uh, no, foreseeable. Um, uh, I think this computation part can be done. This, but I don't know exactly how the procedure. 
there are i think there are people uh, here in this group who can answer for that mm. okay uh, regarding this how you can yeah. it's a bit of thinking yeah. we can think about it yeah, yeah. so thank you nintoman yes sir thank you so in the morning i did teleportation now students oh. can see that uh -huh. you know things are becoming more sophisticated that is where yeah. nowadays a lot of research is going on what dinto described is in the front line area of research so this kind of communication is the name of the game now so eaves dropping then you know efficiency then fidelity those are the things to be computed cost and finally the channel has to be you know having the coherence all those things are there slowly and steadily yeah. you will get exposed to all of them so thank you dinto Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and all okay, the thanks. audience for listening. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So our next speaker, Namita, I hope is around. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, it's a pleasure to invite Namita to give a talk here. She did her PhD from Pondicherry University. And right now, she is a postdoctoral fellow in a very prestigious uh, fellowship with Professor Rosie Sina in Agarai. And uh, the, you know, the work is a collaborative research project between India and Italy. She is part of uh, this project. And maybe Professor Sina will talk about it when our time comes. So, uh, as I mentioned, again, you know, Namita hails from the land where our Professor George Sudarshan was there. So. Keeping in good tradition, he has contributed significant number of people to quantum information, quantum computation. Now, Namita, please go ahead. Make it twenty-five plus five, twenty-five minutes long. Yes, five minutes for questions. So, yeah, you can share your screen. Yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah. So I hope my screen is visible. Hello. Yeah, it is visible. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Visible. So yeah. thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Prasan, sir, for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this uh, work, uh, summer school on QIQT twenty one. So <clears throat> today I'm going to discuss about uh, uh, part of my work carried out during my PhD. So it's about uh, open quantum system. Uh, so actually in quantum system when it interacts with some surrounding field it becomes open and the system when uh, so what happens is the system when it interacts with the environment loses its coherence properties and becomes uh, uh, decoher to the environment and loses uh, its uh, uh, entanglement properties which we call it as entanglement uh, sudden death so which is considered to be a serious threat to many practical applications of quantum information processing so somehow we have to control this loss of entanglement and maintain or prolong this entanglement for a long time during the evolution is something very important so here we investigate a scheme to control this entanglement longevity in open quantum system and uh, later i also discuss about different quantum correlations that is evolving in this particular open quantum systems so my talk is uh, outline of my talk is something like this so i'll briefly uh, introduce about uh, the basics of uh, entanglement and uh, the particular model that we considered is a two atom model and the different characteristic features obtained during the entanglement dynamics of a particular two atom model such as entanglement sudden death and sudden birth and its revival and we developed a scheme to control this entanglement sudden death in the system and then uh, the evolution of different non local correlations has been investigated and finally i'll conclude my talk so as we all know that quantum entanglement is a non local correlation between any two particles no matter how far they are apart in space so we can uh, we cannot represent as a direct product of the two particles they are spatially separated we can only have the information about them and their uh, system so we cannot represent it in the uh, direct product of their subsystem states so we use here uh, concurrence which is a measure of entanglement it quantifies how much the state is entangled okay so based on uh, 
the interaction with the system, with the environment, we classify it as uh, the quantum system can be classified into closed systems and open systems. In closed systems, it considered to be an ideal uh, systems where we do not have the system does not have an interaction with the environment and the dynamics are initially invisible. So, but whereas in real case, if you come to the real situation where you cannot have such an ideal case, so always the system will be interacting with the environment. So it leads to a process called decoherence. And here, the Hamiltonian will have an extra term here, where it, where it is like uh, coming due to the interaction with the system and environment. So such system can be studied using some uh, master equation method. So there are different techniques to study the evolution. So one of them is we adopt here is the Lindblad master equation. Uh, <clears throat> so it actually describes the dynamics of the system. Uh, and the dynamics will be uh, non-unitary because of the uh, Lindbladian operator, which represents here in this equation, uh, LJ. Uh, so this represents the dissipation that happens in the system. So this uh, evolution is uh, non-unitary evolution, and but with positivity. So we actually uh, study such uh, uh, open quantum system. So the particular model that we consider here is a two atom model. So here you can see that there are two atoms which are spatially separated by some distance, and they are coupled through some dipole forces. And what happens in quantum system, the atoms are nothing but uh, qubits. So they can be represented as a two-level system with ground and excited states. So we are interested in uh, the two-atom model, which is coupled to some bath. That is, it can be a vacuum bath or thermal bath, etc. So we consider here the dynamics of system alone. So our interest is to study the dynamics of the system. So we have to trace out the information of the environment from the total system to get the system state. And we use this uh, mastrication. So here it is under Markovian approximation, we use lehmberg agarwal mastrication to study the dynamics of the system. So here, this represents the particular master equation, which is represented in this uh, box. So actually, uh, so this represents the time evolution of the system. So we have to solve this equation to get the dynamics of the system. So here, uh, omega zero represents the atomic uh, frequency between the two levels, resonant frequency actually, and omega one the coupling between the two atoms. And gamma ij represents the collective decay rate. Uh, between the levels and n represents capital n represents the average number of photons in the reservoir if n value is equal to zero that corresponds to a vacuum bath and if n value not equal to zero that corresponds to some thermal bath okay so what happens is that before it starts to uh, interact that is at time t equal to zero the two atoms are like two spatially separate levels and when it uh, start to interact with each other and also with the bath, it uh, collectively behaves as a single four-level system, which is called as collective atomic system or decay basis, where we have uh, the four basis vectors for our dynamics are uh, one ground state and excited state and two intermediate states, such as symmetric and anti-symmetric state. So this represents the four atomic levels here. So these are the different transition that happens between these different levels. And this is the eigenbasis for the uh, Hamiltonian. And so we know that the dynamics of any uh, system is basically here, it is depends on the initial condition or the initial state that we are constrained. So, so if you start with some initial states, we can be we can have the freedom to choose the initial state, either pure state or in mixer state. So among the pure state, the state can be purely uh, from mixed case also. So all this class of state uh, all belongs to some class of X state where we have diagonal and anti-diagonal elements. For such class of states, we use such X states to study the uh, evolution and we will find out the entanglement of the particular evolution. So that is the basic idea. So, <clears throat> so we start with different initial states. Let's say the first graph, it shows a one atom excited case. 
it is like e1 g2 state where we can see that initially the state is unentangled with concurrent zero we can see that how as time progresses the state uh, evolves to have an entangled state and becomes uh, entangled throughout the evolution so this is called the creation of entanglement and in the second graph you can see when both atom in the excited case you can see a delayed creation of entanglement and in the case of uh, bell state if you start with an initial bell state all the bell states are having initially same uh, entanglement but they behave differently in their evolution so among this if you see uh, the bell state of uh, five plus state the evolution you can see there is a finite time death of entanglement which is called as entanglement sudden death and it remains uh, zero for some time zero for some time and it revives after after the est so this is called entanglement sudden death followed by revival so similarly the corresponding werner state also you can see that there is an faster entanglement loss followed by some revival so we actually interested in uh, entanglement sudden death because we want to control this entanglement loss in the system so that we can use it for practical applications so if you look at different schemes to control this decoherence in the uh, evolution there are different methods in literature among them one of the uh, most simple method is uh, use of local unitary operations basically quantum gates are used so <clears throat> in local unitary operations actually uh, will be applied during some time during the evolution which will not alter uh, the state of the system but actually and it uh, actually changes the state but preserves the entanglement so we can use this local unitary operation the most commonly used local unitary operations are poly x gates and z gates and their different combinations so here this is a particular uh, operation how we uh, implement in uh, during the evolution so what we will do is uh, so this is the initial state so we will apply this uh, let's say xx gate if you are applying in the initial state during the evolution you can see uh, it is applying on both the qubits so the it will change the state of the system to a particular form like same x form is preserved with same entanglement the only difference here is the in the the elements the matrix elements is interchanged but entanglement remains same so we will use this initial state and make evolve the state to further with the markovian evolution which will give a further enhanced evolution during the evol uh, during the dynamics so i will explain this so in the case of uh, let's say bell state we can see that here uh, shows the concurrence evolution of bell state so this solid line shows the entanglement evolution without applying uh, uh, local gate operation so you can see that there is an esd happens and remains uh, unentangled for a some for some time and it revives so here if you are using some exit gate operation at some time let's say uh, let's say some uh, like some time during the evolution then uh, it will uh, give a better entanglement in the evolution so let's say you can see if you are using exit gate operation in this particular time window of gamma t so you can see that in that range if you are applying this local gate operation and make the state to evolve with the new uh, initial state you can see a better uh, evolution entanglement evolution in the system which is avoiding the esd throughout the evolution so in the case of phi plus we can use both xz and xi gate operations uh, depends upon what time it is switching so we have uh, found out the different time windows for different gate operation which is applied at some time during the evolution which will avoid est okay so we have actually identified the gate operation which is avoiding est so similarly we can also look at uh, entanglement revival so you can see if 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 like if we can uh, apply this local unitary operations to get a uh, or advance the revival time of the system so that we can reduce the disentanglement time that is happening in the evolution so here if you use xi gate operation and xz gate operation just after the est time you can see there is a faster revival compared to the actual evolution so this way we can reduce the disentanglement time so it is also quite uh, interesting and similarly we have uh, done the same calculation for werner state which is a mixed state and uh, we have identified different gate operations 
and time windows for switching so that it will avoid ESD in the evolution. Similarly, there are different uh, X state, also different class of X state. Also, we have done the same calculation and identified different gate operation that is avoiding ESD during the evolution. So we also want to look at in general, uh, like what will happen. So so far, I have discussed the dynamics of the system which is interacting with a vacuum bath. So what will happen to the dynamics in the thermal bath? Whether we can avoid the ESD up the, or delay the ESD during the dynamics with switching with the different gate operation or not. So if you look at uh, a bell state in the thermal bath, what will happen is that the red line shows uh, the initially entangled state, which is undergoing a finite time depth at some time during 2.81 and never revise. So if you are using local gate operation sometime uh, just after its uh, uh, evolution, uh, we can see that if you use XZ gate or XI gate operation, we can always delay the ESD time to uh, some more time so that um, we can actually use this particular time windows for applying this experiment using this uh, time. You can actually uh, do this uh, experimental calculations so that we can uh, prolong the entanglement in this time. So, but we can always uh, delay the ESD, but cannot be avoided in this case. So you can see that uh, even though if you switch at some time, it is giving a better entanglement in the evolution, but finally it is undergoing a uh, finite time death after some time. So similarly, we have done the same calculation for Werner state and uh, different uh, class of Werner states. And we could see that it is always possible to find a gate operation, which is uh, delaying the ESD time, but cannot be avoided. So, so this also uh, the different class of X states also we could identify the time windows for switching. So in all these cases, what we observed that uh, this ESD is something which is inevitable in the case of thermal bath, even in the presence of uh, su uh, switching with this local gate operation. We cannot control ESD that happens in thermal bath, but can be delayed. So we can use this uh, local gate operation to prolong the entanglement for some time. Okay. So, and the last part, yeah, hello. Okay. So the so the final part of my talk is about the uh, the the loss of different non-local correlations in the decoherence process. So we consider here uh, the non-local correlations such as bell function violation and teleportation fidelity. They consider to be the two uh, uh, measures of uh, non-local correlations. So if the bell function violates, like if the bell parameter, which is actually uh, varies between minus two and plus two value. If it is greater than uh, two, then we say that the state exists highly non-local correlations. So in the, similarly, in the case of teleportation fidelity, the state to be quantumly teleported, then the value called fidelity, F of rho, which is should be greater than two by three value. So such state can be used for quantum teleportation. If that value is less than two by three, you cannot use it for uh, quantum teleportation. It comes to the classical limit. So, uh, so we have investigated the law of this correlation, how it behaves in the dynamics of a vacuum bath. We can see that uh, the black line, dotted line shows the bell function, uh, loss of bell, bell inequality violation. So you can see that it, it drops to the value of two faster as compared to the teleportation uh, fidelity values, you can see that blue line shows the teleportation uh, fidelity evolution. So you can see the bell function decays faster as compared to the teleportation fidelity. And then finally, the concurrence goes to zero. So in the uh, Werner case also, Werner state also, we can see the similar characteristics where the higher order non-local correlation, which is the bell inequality violation, which decays faster as compared to the lower order correlations. So if you consider the coherence or quantum discard, which is also uh, measures of non-local correlation. So if you see the those uh, characteristics also, you can see that all these uh, two non-local correlation will be decaying uh, 
I mean, it will comes under the concurrence curve. That means uh, it will decay much slower than concurrence. So that order of degree of non-locality is being followed. So this is also we have done for different uh, MEMS states, that is maximal entangled mixture state. And this we can uh, observe, uh, or we can we can establish the hierarchical laws of non-local correlations in this particular Markovian open quantum systems. That is, the higher order correlations will decay faster as compared to the lower order correlations. So these are some of my conclusions. So we consider here an open quantum system, which is a two qubit system, specially separated and interacting, and it is coupled to some common bath, either vacuum bath or thermal bath. And we have identified different uh, time windows for switching with uh, different gate operation, which is actually avoiding ESD in the case of vacuum bath, but it is found to be an inevitable feature in the evolution of the system, which is coupled to a thermal bath. So we actually find out different time windows for switching with different gate operations in the case of both vacuum bath and thermal bath. And finally, uh, we also found uh, hierarchical loss of non-local correlations between uh, different initial states. And we found that the higher order non-local correlations decays faster as compared to the lower order correlations and in the Markovian evolution. So this is a conclusion and thank you. So thank you, Namita, for finishing exactly on time. Some questions yeah, are already sir. there in the chat box. Uh, yeah, okay. so there is one question in the chat box. Uh, Akshay Kumar has asked, uh, conceptual difference between local unitary transformation and global unitary evolution. So the concept, can you repeat that? Yeah, so he wanted to ask what is the conceptual difference between local unitary transformation and okay. global unitary evolution? Okay, so in local unitary uh, transformation means uh, it is applying on particular states like local in nature. It will not alter the entanglement. Uh, I mean, in local unit operation, what it does is, if you are applying at some state, the entanglement is being preserved, and uh, it will not disturb the entanglement of the system. In global uh, local unitary operation, um, exactly not don't, not no not exactly, but uh, I think that it will change the entire system. Like, it will change the uh, entanglement or non-local correlation of this. But local unitary operation, it actually changes the state but preserves the entanglement. Uh, there is another question. Uh, why open system is modeled using Markovian processes? Can it be modeled using non-Markovian processes? Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, you can always model a system with non-Markovian uh, systems. So here, uh, Markovian is something. Uh, it's an approximation actually. So in Markovian case, you can. It is a kind of a memoryless channel where the system and the environment interact in such a way that uh, the system does not have the memory of its past. That is the information backflow from environment to the system will not happen in the case of Markovian. So in such cases, uh, this uh, revival of entanglement is not uh, quite obvious in Markovian system. Whereas in non-Markovian means you can always go for non-Markovian, which is uh, very, uh, uh, it is very obvious to have a, uh, Revival in the non-Markovian cases where we can have the information backflow between the environment to the system. So it is, uh, you can always go for uh, Markovian or non-Markovian, it's possible. So here we have considered only Markovian cases. You can also look at the uh, non-Markovian case also. So, is that okay, so if there are no more questions, let us thank Namita for a wonderful talk and really introducing the frontline research area of the coherence and how to deal with them, how to keep the entanglement intact. They are really frontline areas of research. Without this, a quantum operation cannot be possible. Thank you, sir. So let us now welcome uh, Dr. Paulson. I hope he's around. Yeah, I'm around, sir. I'm around. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Paulson, who is now in the Institute of Physics, Bhuneswar. And that he also did his PhD with Professor Satyanarayana from Collegiate University. And, uh, you know, I mean, I have also worked with him as a thorough understanding of 
you know, there could be different kind of quantum you know, communication in noisy channel, optimization, variety of things. You know, for example, fissure information, then, you know, and uh, figure out camera out the inequality. You know, these are basically exactly the front line kind of research what is going on now. So now I request Dr. Paulson to give his talk. Make yeah. it 25 plus five. So one minute, sir, I have a problem with the sharing my screen. Yeah. 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 So my next slide is. Now is it okay? Uh, I think my yeah. Now it is fine, right? Yes, yes, it's visible. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Professor Panigrahi, for giving wonderful introduction and giving this opportunity to uh, present uh, my works. So today uh, I'm just planning to uh, discuss on uh, uh, evolution of evolution speed of a quantum system and the different approach to quantify or estimate uh, uh, quantum speed limit and um, uh, how this uh, quantum uh, speed limit time is connected to um, a dynamics of uh, quantum correlation uh, under Markovian and uh, non-Markovian uh, interactions. Uh, so to this end, uh, I would like to uh, add uh, uh, one of the famous uh, remarks of uh, uh, Einstein uh, on uh, indeterminacy of, uh, uh, I mean, that has been observed in uh, uh, quantum uh, dynamics. So once uh, in a letter to Niels Bohr, actually, he pointed out that uh, quantum uh, mechanics is certainly there is, there is one request. Uh, yeah. Just do a full screen. Oh, one minute, please. Is it okay now? It is still, yeah, 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 perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. yeah. So yeah, as I mentioned before, actually, one time Einstein uh, wrote to uh, Niels Bohr uh, on about quantum mechanics. Uh, he was saying that uh, quantum mechanics is certainly impossible, uh, but an inner voice tells me that it is not a the real thing. Uh, the theory uh, says a lot, uh, but uh, but does not really bring us any closer to the secret of the old one. I, at any rate. I'm convinced that he does not throw dice. Uh, he was, I mean, this discomfort actually uh, leads to the, I mean, later stage leads to the, uh, the title which I have uh, chosen uh, uh, today. So when it comes to, uh, I mean, as you know, that uh, uncertainty principle, I mean, given by this particular uh, expression, uh, in the case of uh, momentum and position coordinates, uh, as everyone knows, uh, it's talk about the, I mean, uh, the precision of uh, uh, simultaneous measurement and all. So, but when it comes to energy and uh, uh, time, um, and story is uh, uh, slightly uh, uh, puzzling. So Einstein uh, was having a counter argument. Uh, he, I mean, this is one of his thought experiment to negate uh, that uh, energy time uncertainty is not possible. I mean, uncertainty principle is not possible in that way uh, they have proposed. So he was trying to say that you can consider a uh, box containing of photons, uh, which has a hole in one of its walls. This hole can be opened and closed by a shutter controlled by a clock inside the uh, box. Since the clock uh, is a classical uh, entity, obviously you can always, uh, I mean, with infinite precision, uh, the duration of the uh, duration can be uh, identified. So when it comes to special theory of relativity also, uh, by measuring the mass of the box in the gravitational field, the change in energy due to the loss of photon can also be determined with infinite precision. So as a consequence, he was trying to say that special theory, I mean, uh, relativity seems to negate the existence of uncertainty principle for uh, energy and uh, time. So Bohr uh, tried to make a counter argument. Uh, he was trying to say that uh, to measure time uh, position uh, I mean, to measure time, position, and momentum of the hands of clock have to be determined. Then obviously, uh, in that sense, uh, you can always say that there exists uh, uncertainty in measurement for a position and the momentum coordinate. In that way, you can consider that in the case of uh, um, 
energy and time also there exists a, a uncertainty principle even this was not that much appealing uh, so people were trying to uh, discuss uh, uh, a different interpretation of this uh, energy uh, time and certainty relation of that kind uh, mandelstam tam actually in uh, 1945 if i'm not wrong actually he has given the first expression of a quantum speed limit and he was trying to say that this is not about energy time uncertainty and is not about simultaneous measurement it's something about some intrinsic time scale of unitary dynamics so you can always interpret a delta t as the uh, time uh, that quantum system need to evolve from an uh, initial to a final state. Uh, this is a bit more appealing in that sense. Uh, you can always talk about uh, the evolution time between the initial and the uh, final state. So my, uh, in this first paper, actually, he has discussed all this in uh, unitary dynamics. The later stage, uh, in this uh, Marcus Levitin, actually, he has come with uh, a different uh, derivation, actually. So uh, he has talked about the minimum time of evolution between two orthogonal states then uh, 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 you can unify both bounds and uh, this will be the uh, so you can always talk about uh, the evolution between two orthogonal state uh, this is uh, in short actually it is called mt bound and you can um, uh, call it this ml bound the main thing you are supposed to uh, realize is that in the case of mt bound uh, it is always the square root of the variance we are calculating but when it comes to ml bound uh, we are calculate the expectation uh, value. So these are the uh, two, uh, uh, I mean, uh, bounds actually. So you, you have to always find out the uh, tighter one in that one so that you have to go for the maximum of uh, uh, these two uh, values. So later actually, I one bomb actually formalized the energy time uncertainty principle as a bound on the minimal time of quantum evolution. Uh, this is something different from, as you know, different from the uh, momentum, uh, I mean, uh, coordinate, uh, uh, uncertainty principle. So, uh, uh, as it has been discussed before, when it comes to open quantum system, uh, these kind of stories are also really appealing. So, we always think about, uh, uh, I mean, if we're fixing some uh, initial and final state, uh, we always think about um, how much time or how fast the evolution will be and uh, how can we uh, quantify and what are the parameters which really depend on this evolution of uh, evolution speed of the quantum system. So as everyone knows, actually, this is the uh, master equation. Uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, uh, something like, uh, like uh, the current operators are there. And this, uh, if it is negative, actually, then we can say that uh, uh, evolution will be uh, CP indivisible in that way. Uh, so, uh, I, I, these things are really important actually uh, when it comes to, because we are uh, all, we are interested in looking for all kinds of uh, uh, interaction, I mean the interaction with the memory and without memory. Uh, so, these things really matter uh, how, uh, how a dynamics can be expressed in terms of uh, uh, master equation. So, uh, this is uh, later in 2013. Uh, after a long period, long uh, gap, uh, uh, people have come up with a speed limit time for an open quantum system. This open quantum system, it is this is an empty kind of the bound where, uh, as I have discussed before, uh, empty type uh, of uh, speed limit time for open quantum system. Here, people have made use of uh, uh, relative purity. And relative purity can be uh, expressed in this way. And uh, this is the particular expression for uh, the generalization with the time uh, dependent uh, uh, Lindblad equation or Lindbladian type equation can be also uh, used. So this will be that particular expression to calculate the speed limit time. So um, again, uh, if you're using cross operator, uh, uh, instead of this master equation, actually, if you're using quantum channels in that way, you can make use of this expression. Uh, you can check this uh, particular pair uh, uh, to uh, get more information about uh, uh, the der derivation and all. Uh, it's really interesting, actually. You will get a flavor of how we can calculate speed limit when you're dealing with uh, master equation or if you're dealing with, uh, uh, I mean, quantum channels in that way. So, uh, as I said before, there are different approaches to quantify the or estimate this quantum uh, speed limit time. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, approaches. Here we are using a geometrical approach. We have to calculate the uh, Bure's angle between the uh, initial and final state. 
Uh, in the uh, empty and ML bound, actually, which I have discussed in the case of uh, uh, unitary evolution, we have talked about uh, evolution between two orthogonal states. Here, actually, you can always think about, uh, I mean, uh, uh, different states. I mean, it need not be orthogonal in that sense. So this is the, the expression for uh, uh, quantum speed limit time. Uh, I mean, you can always find that uh, when you take the operator norm, it will be a maximum. Operator norm will be, I mean, that expression will be of this uh, ML kind. Yeah, uh, you can uh, calculate the uh, Buras angle by using this particular expression. Uh, you can find the uh, details, more details uh, from this uh, paper also. So uh, in my case, actually, I have been making use uh, uh, this uh, quantum speed limit, and uh, I was just trying to connect it with the uh, quantum correlation. Uh, so these things you have already known, actually, how to uh, different dynamics of quantum correlation. Is there any particular connection between uh, uh, quantum speed limit uh, uh, time and uh, the evolution of quantum correlation? So I have chosen a two-qubit system initially. Uh, then uh, all these uh, uh, fidelity, uh, teleportation fidelity, entanglement, uh, violation of Bell CHS inequality, everything, uh, you guys are aware about all these things. So, uh, and the one I, I have used, made use of the steering also. Uh, so, initially, I have considered a non unical quantum channel, which is essentially a non orco in amplitude damping channel. So, I was just checking how this evolution happens, what really happens to. Uh, I mean, this quantum correlation when it undergoes this kind of, uh, uh, I mean, quantum channel. So uh, this is uh, slightly interesting in that way, uh, as it has been mentioned, in this case, you can observe some uh, revival of uh, quantum correlation. Uh, for the time being, actually, I just, I'm just inviting your attention on this particular point, uh, where the revival, the value of gamma T or something like that, where the revival of quantum correlation occurs. So as I have said before, uh, this, uh, I mean, the decay of this correlation is slightly delayed uh, when you compare to, this is the Markovian case, Markovian uh, amplitude damping channel. So here uh, the decay is slightly faster, but in this case, uh, the decay is slightly uh, uh, delayed uh, uh, due to the um, information backflow or uh, the memory of the quantum channel. So I just want to note this particular point where the revival occurs. So uh, in that case, uh, uh, we have observed that uh, the revival exactly matches with the, uh, a, a change in this uh, dynamics of quantum speed limit. The revival of quantum correlation exactly matches. So this is slightly interesting. Uh, this happens only with the uh, non-unital quantum channel. When we check with the, um, I mean, uh, unital uh, quantum channel, we couldn't observe such kind of uh, uh, connection. So uh, as I have said before, uh, this is the particular order in which, uh, uh, I mean, the DQ of uh, uh, quantum correlations occur. So uh, entanglement, I mean, uh, it decays, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, a bit slowly. When it comes to Bell inequality and uh, uh, this uh, local fit and variable fidelity, which is connected to local fit and variable theory, uh, that actually decays a bit faster. And the other thing, I mean, uh, these are the noise uh, parameter values at which uh, the DK uh, uh, occurs. So, uh, I mean, uh, so, so as I said before, uh, the revival also occur in the same fashion. I mean, uh, I mean, the uh, lower degree uh, quantum correlation revival, uh, uh, I mean, immediately, and then higher degree will be a bit uh, slow in that way, actually. With the, so that is also connected in that way. Uh, this was our primary motivation. Uh, and we could understand that uh, in the case of uh, speed leap dynamics, uh, the revival of quantum correlation occur exactly at particular point. It matches with the dynamics of uh, speed limit. This is not true in the case of uh, uh, Markovian channel, which is quite obvious because there is no uh, backflow of information. So it, it just goes, uh, I mean, uh, increasing. Uh, so, yeah, uh, as I said before, here the DK is, uh, I mean, slightly faster than the uh, Markovian, sorry, non Markovian uh, yeah, interaction. So, that is also, uh, this is the uh, speed limit time of uh, Markovian. Here, since there is no backflow of information, it is also going in this way. 
So this is another uh, channel which we have considered. I mean, uh, it is also interesting in that sense. Here we have considered some CP divisible uh, phase damping channel. So this is these are the uh, cross operators. And uh, here actually, as I have uh, said before, you can uh, uh, very well notice that uh, in the case of uh, uh, Markovian uh, and the non-Markovian uh, quantum channels, I'm in the non -Mar Markovian and non-Markovian regimes, uh, as I said before, uh, it is slightly delayed actually. Uh, when it comes to uh, Markovian, it is a bit faster in that sense. So. And that is when you can also see it from uh, the dynamics of uh, speed limit also. So, uh, I mean, this is all about the composite system which we have considered. Uh, we were trying we were trying to connect it with the uh, dynamics of correlations, uh, especially quantum correlation. So in the case of uh, uh, how the speed limit is connected to a measure of non mark is another work which we have carried out. So in that case, uh, we have again we have considered some amplitude damping channel. I mean, non Markovian amplitude damping channel, and uh, some other uh, uh, I mean, uh, non Markovian defacing channels also. In that case, also uh, we have made use of a, a measure of uh, uh, non Markovianity as a deviation from uh, temporal self similarity. Uh, these I mean, the details of this expression, everything has been discussed in this particular paper. So you can always find it, and it will be really interesting in then how far it is from, I mean, a temporal self similarity. That is the one way to quantify the uh, non mark community. We have made use of that measure of non mark community, and we have, under, uh, we have tried to understand how this uh, speed limit time is connected to uh, uh, memory. I mean, this can be considered as a measure of memory. So in that case, uh, this is uh, interesting and uh, in that sense. So as I said before, uh, as memory increases, this is the measure of memory. As memory increases, uh, the speed limit time uh, decreases. So uh, non-Markovian uh, channels or non-Markovian evaluations are faster than the uh, Markovian one. So we have made use of this uh, a few channels, which are uh, uh, some uh, amplitude damping channel and uh, OUN and RT. And these things are also, uh, yeah. So in this paper, you can always find out those results. So this is uh, slightly uh, interesting in that sense, because uh, as you increase the memory, uh, you can always uh, find that speed limit time is uh, uh, decreasing. Um, uh, in that sense, you can always say that uh, if the memory is high, uh, I mean the uh, I mean the dynamics or the evolution between the states will be uh, a bit faster in that. So uh, coming to uh, an end, uh, what we have done or uh, what are the application? Uh, I mean, what is the need of uh, uh, looking into these kind of approaches? I mean, uh, how fast a state can be, uh, I mean, a system can be evolved between uh, two states. So uh, these are a few applications. So you can always uh, think about uh, uh, studying speed limit to set the maximum rate with the quantum information can be communicated. So, or, or information can be processed. The shortest time scale uh, for a quantum uh, algorithm is to converse. Or in the case of, uh, I mean, uh, when you talk about this quantum metrology also there, you always, you are always worried about the uh, precision. There also you can always find, uh, I mean, how these things are connected. Uh, when we talk about, uh, yeah, if it is, uh, I mean, precision about uh, finding out the time or in that way, you will be always uh, able to connect it with the speed limit type. So it's really uh, interesting in that sense. I, I mean, with that, I'm concluding. I, I think that uh, I'll be able to uh, give a, um, a, at least a peripheral and or understanding or flavor about this quantum speed limit and how it is connected to the dynamics of different quantum correlation. And, and uh, I mean, uh, how the behavior of uh, speed limit time uh, under uh, uh, memory and memoryless uh, channels. With this, I'm, yeah. Hello. And uh, we're open for questions now. Uh, excuse me. I, I have I have one question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So have you explored the quantum the VQSL in this case? 
स्विच रहा है द द स्पीड क्वांटम स्पीड लिमिट वी क्यू एस एल एंड इफ इट इज एनी वे कनेक्टेड विद द क्वांटम को रिलेशन क्वांटम डायने so uh, so it may be what to looking uh, for the uh, speed quantum speed thing because uh, as you uh, make the tighter and tighter bound on the, the speed yeah. then uh, then you can uh, follow up the uh, the dynamics easily yeah. and yeah, you that's can correct. connect yeah yeah the, the, i mean the sahal uh, mentioned in that uh, geometrical approach uh, when you talk about this ml bound uh, then that is uh, i mean more tighter in that sense so uh, i mean i mean this may not be tighter actually if you are going for some uh, mixed uh, initial state then also story will be uh, different uh, you will be i mean you'll have to i mean derive uh, or uh, yeah uh, which one is tighter in that sense in that case if you're using pure states uh, so it depends on essentially it depends on the initial states which we you make use of Uh, okay so i have another question is that yeah. uh, instead uh, you are exploring it in the open system and uh, and how this uh, tau qsl is connected with the memory effect which you mentioned uh, uh, in your uh, uh, slide so uh, let's say you have the closed system then what else uh, can you derive uh, from this uh, uh, for any closed system if you are exploring the entanglement or anything then uh, what is from the dynamics uh, Uh, I mean, from the dynamical point of view, what else uh, can be done in this uh, from this tau QSL or the speed? Yeah, as I have said before, I mean the the uh, mandel stump. Uh, I mean the initial bound which we have discussed. Uh, that is uh, there we have considered system in the closed environment, right? So there uh, they have talked about uh, the minimum time uh, required uh, for evolving between uh, two orthogonal uh, states. so from there actually i mean it has taken much long time to uh, come to open quantum system uh, or in open quantum system things are a bit more appealing in the sense uh, the dynamics is uh, is not essentially it is the evolution or uh, transformation whatever we talk about is in uh, the nature is uni- non unitary right so in that sense it is a bit more appealing uh, i mean the uh, and the initial state how Have shown that uh, you can always think about the uh, uh, unitary dynamics and uh, how this uh, system evolves in a closed system. Yeah, thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, let us thank Dr. Paulson. Thank you, Paulson. Uh, th- thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. I have uh, some questions. I like few more because. Ah, uh, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Yeah, I'll come. I'll come. So now I did not read this paper of yours. Very nice paper. Yeah, thank you, Professor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now we are. We have the last talk of the day. That's by our own student Atira. She works with Professor Nimalde Bose. Not a doctor yet, but soon going to be. So she works on optics and has a, you know, leg both in theory and experiment. So I request Atira to give her presentation. Atira, are you around? Yes, yes. So shall I start sharing my screen? Yeah, also, if you remove your thing. Yeah, oh, one minute, sir. One minute, one minute. Oh, I have to stop sharing, right? Yeah. Right, it's done, sir. Okay, I hope it is visible right now. Yeah, it is. Yes, yes, yes. Make full screen also. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Pani Kri and the organizers of, of QIQT to give me an opportunity to present my work in this platform. with this uh, let's get started uh, title for the today's talk is interferometric weak measurement with polarized light 
it is a collective work or effort of everyone mentioned here niladri madak dr mantirapal dr ankit kumar singh anvesha panda and most importantly professor ghosh so so it's all started in 1988 with the paper having a unusual title how the result of a measurement of a component of the spin of a half particle can turn out to be 100 by arno albert and weidman professor fabricio and i others have introduced the term weak measurement weak value but still for the sake of completeness i am going to give a brief overview in quantum theory the result of a measurement of a variable a which has discrete eigen values ai must necessarily be one of those values the hamiltonian of standard measurement or the von neumann measurement is given by this expression uh, where g of t is the normalization factor such that the time integral is unity q is the canonical variable of the measuring device with a conjugate momentum pi or p a is the observable now let's take the initial state of the measuring device as a gaussian uh, whether in position domain or in momentum domain with a spread of delta pi or delta p which is quite smaller than the difference between the position of the eigen values ai then after interaction we shall be left with a mixture of gaussians located around different eigen values so the measurement of uh, this pi or p indicate the value of a the other scenario is where we have a distribution as a spread of delta pi but the delta pi is very much greater than the difference in the position between the eigen values in that case uh, we will get the probability distribution will be close to a gaussian with again a delta pi spread so the center of the gaussian will be at the minimum value of a and but this measurement will give no information since the spread is larger than the expectation value of a as i mentioned before one way is to get the information is by repeating the experiment many times and try uh, getting the information now let's see what aherno albert and whiteman proposed so weak measurement let us consider a device which has an initial state phi in Uh, represented in uh, q that is position and p that is in the momentum domain so where uh, phi in tilde is the fourier transform of phi in so if we consider it is it to be a gaussian so the fourier transform will also be gaussian with centered uh, p equal to 0 uh, with a width of delta p so the delta q the delta is uh, represented by delta q so and delta p is equivalent to 1 by 2 delta so if you take the weak measurement the pre selected state will be represented like this the summation of an which is the eigen values an a equal to an the eigen states so this undergoes a weak interaction so this is the kind of interaction that i've shown earlier where the uh, splitting or uh, the splitting is in such a way that the width is very much Uh, greater when compared to the uh, difference between the position of the eigen values so what a we proposed in such a situation is that to make a post selection of the state of the quantum system that is immediately after this weak interaction so that uh, you uh, with some other variable uh, b and select only one outcome so you get a detection with a post selection so in this case the final state is uh, represented by this where e raised to minus iqa we will be expanding this and a we considered only the first order approximation we'll talk about the other approximation later on in the presentation uh, so here this factor is called as the weak value so the uh, the wave function is a gaussian centered uh, the final wave function is a gaussian centered around uh, aw and in that case uh, uh, if the shy in that is the pre selection state and the final states are equal the weak value is equal to the usual expectation value of operator a and in weak measurement the initial and final states are in different generally different and a consequence of weak value can be complex so if they are nearly orthogonal the weak value can become arbitrarily large and beyond the eigen eigen value regime the pointer 
position indicates uh, the uh, uh, real part of the weak value and the momentum, the point of momentum indicates the imaginary part. So to get this, they have considered that uh, the uh, uh, QAW is uh, very much less than one and they went on to become, uh, went on to go for this uh, 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 first order approximation. So this is a linear response regime. Uh, and so again, this the same final state can be represented in a, a indifference, uh, indifference where A and A and star are represented, represented by the indifference term. So the final, uh, during the indifference, the complicated cancellations can take place, take place between the individual Gaussian distribution and produce a function which peaks is shifted to one side. So since this is an indifference phenomena, it can be set in classical optical setting. So this was proposed by uh, Duck, Stevenson, and Sudarshan in 1982 with an experimental proposal where uh, pre-selection and post-selection is done by a, a polarizer and the weak interaction is introduced using a birefringent crystal tilted in such a way that the extraordinary and ordinary ray is separated weakly. And in 1991, Ritchie, Story, and Hullet actually realized experimentally the same experimental setup. And the application of weak measurements started steering uh, in 2008 by the pioneering work of Hostel and Quiet by the experimental detection of spin hall effect of light. Next, I'll be just showing you uh, what is the effect on uh, this epsilon value. So what epsilon value means is how much it is uh, away from the orthogonal state. So if epsilon value is zero, uh, that means it is near orthogonal. So in that case, so this plot is here is showing the uh, detection and this is the indifference. Thing. So at zero, you can see a double um, Gaussian and as the epsilon value increases, the centroid or the peak value is shifting towards zero. And on the right side, I'm showing you uh, the experimental detection of a spin hall effect where you can see that uh, it's, uh, there is a transverse uh, shift in the y direction in the central by changing the epsilon value that by changing the angle of the post-selection polarizer. So you can clearly see the central shift when you change the polarization. That is the post-selection. Now, so nearly in the, uh, destructive interference between the eigenstates of the measuring observable as a consequence of nearly mutual orthogonal pre and post selections of the system. So this is the interpretation of weak measurement. So now we want to make a question, is it possible to integrate the concept of this weak measurement with the common interferometry so that the weak value amplification and appropriate weak interaction may evolve naturally, whether is it possible? So we uh, are trying for this interferometric weak value amplification of polarization anisotropy here. So unlike, so how do we do this? Unlike others, uh, the pointers they use is, uh, uh, usually people use uh, the spatial profile of the beam and pre-selected with polarization uh, and post-selected with again the polarization states. But here we are uh, get, taking the pointer to be the polarization state and the weak interaction to be the polarization anisotropy. It can be uh, optical rotation, uh, linear reta uh, retardation, linear diatonation, or circular diatonation. But here, uh, uh, I, in, the, in this presentation, I'm only showing the example of polarization rotation. And I'll show you how the experiment has been realized and how for other polarization anisotropy, how you can uh, uh, do the experiment also. And in this case, the post selection is done by path itself. So that's done by the interferometer itself, where the, near, uh, the path, the near destructive interference is acting as the post selection to this process. Now, here, uh, if I take alpha to be the small polarization rotation, and in one path, I'm taking a X polarized light, in other path, I'm giving a rotation uh, with alpha. So the resultant electric field with respect to the phase will be something like this. And this is related to the imaginary weak value amplification. And in the case of real weak value amplification in terms of the amplitude, amplitude ratio, that is the intensity ratio 
uh, of the uh, field, uh, yeah, the resultant field can be expressed in this form. So here, epsilon p is the phase offset from the destructive interference position, and epsilon e is, a is the amplitude offset at exactly at the interference, destructive interference. Uh, interference. So this imaginary weak value and real weak value amplification can be related to the Stokes parameters. Uh, in imaginary, it is related to the Stokes parameter V by I. And in real, it is related to uh, Stokes U and Q. So half tan inverse U by Q will be uh, shy, that is optical uh, shy parameter will be related to the uh, real weak value. Now I'll be showing you how the uh, experimental realization is done for imaginary weak value amplification. So the results I'll be showing is for alpha equal to one degree. So you have a laser here uh, 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 and it has been polarized. So uh, this is a non-polarizing beam splitter that we use. And uh, in one path you have a polarized light. In other path uh, you have a half wave plate rotated by alpha by two so that it rotates the uh, polarization state by alpha, then you have uh, ND, which actually uh, uh, makes the intensity of both this path same, so that uh, uh, you get the interference pattern of high contrast. So you are basically making the intensity of both the path to be same. And this spatial profile has to be uh, measured uh, using a Stokes analysis. So a spatial Stokes mapping has to be done to this. You realize both the real and imaginary. For the for this, I am considering the imaginary. So the Stokes mapping can be done using a pair of polarizers and quarter wave plate. By rotating the quarter wave and polarizer, you can uh, calculate different Stokes vectors spatially. So this is the indifference pattern. So uh, the white line that I've drawn here will correspond, uh, I'll be showing the line intensity corresponding to the white line here. So the line, uh, the, uh, this is the line intensity and the corresponding spatial Stokes V by is uh, plotted downward. And we have taken this region so that uh, we take a certain values of epsilon T that is the phase offset values. So at uh, near uh, in destructive indifference, I am uh, placing the epsilon p to be zero. Uh, and away from this, the, it becomes uh, greater. So the variation of Stokes v by i with respect to the phase offset can be seen like this. The dot represents the experimental results and the red line represents the theoretical fit, which the fit is alpha got epsilon p. So, now moving on to the real experimental, uh, real part of the weak value, the experimental realization is uh, pretty much same apart from the fact that here we are using a, a varying neutral density filter. Since we need to take the Stokes measurement exactly at the interference, a destructive interference point, but with a different uh, intensity ratio. So you need to have a varying ND to uh, change the intensity of uh, this path and you take, uh, you get the indifference here. For each value of amplitude ratio, you take, take the measurement of strokes. So this is the indifference pattern for different values of intensity ratios. Correspondingly, you have uh, the value of uh, U by Q. Uh, and from at, at exact destructive indifference point and by varying the amplitude offset, you have the shy parameter that is half tan inverse U by Q. Uh, and dot here also, the dot represents the experimental uh, results and uh, the red line represents the theoretical fit. The fit is done using alpha cot epsilon A parameter. Now, uh, since I mentioned that uh, the other polarization anisotropies can also be uh, done using this, uh, I have mentioned the optical rotation uh, experimental setting where uh, the halfway plate or any chiral sample is used in one of the paths to take a rotation. And the real and imaginary weak value are reflected in strokes U by Q and B by I. For the case of linear titanation, uh, you take a linear polarizer oriented at a, a small angle from plus 45 degree. And the real and imaginary value are reflected in strokes Q by I and strokes V by I respectively. 
Similarly, for circular dietitian, you have a quarter wave plate uh, with its optic axis oriented at a uh, small angle away from the horizontal polarization. And again, the real and imaginary are reflected in Stokes V by A and U by A. Thereby, you can actually uh, calculate uh, different uh, Stokes uh, parameter and get the real and weak value, uh, re real and imaginary weak value amplification in different anisotropic effects. Now, uh, coming to the important point, the sensitivity of such a measurement. In principle, one can quantify an anisotropy parameter that is alpha uh, from the measurement. Uh, which is alpha cot epsilon times larger than the Stokes parameter. That is for a given uh, sensitivity of a Stokes polarimeter. Using this scheme, one can extract and quantify this anisotropy parameter, that is a polarization anisotropy parameter alpha, which is epsilon times smaller than the sensitivity of the measurement of a given Stokes parameter. So uh, the sensitivity of a particular Stokes parameter can be derived using this relation. And uh, the weak value amplification parameter epsilon, which can be uh, uh, amplitude offset or the phase offset is a small parameter. And uh, this uh, is equivalent to an enhancement of the sensitivity of any conventional Stokes parameter. Like, uh, but it is important to mention here uh, that like any other weak value amplification approaches, here also large amplification of the polariz of uh, the anisotropy parameter, that is a polarization and anisotropy parameter, comes at the expense of intensity of the signal. So here we show the uncertainty in uh, V by with uh, uh, for uh, optical rotation case for uh, a variation of uh, phase offset epsilon p. So this is for the case of alpha equal to 0 0.035 radians. And here, uh, it implies that as epsilon p approaches zero, the sensitivity of the determination of uh, Stokes V by I parameter deteriorates. That is, the uncertainty increases, which is expected since the overall intensity falls as this uh, v, uh, as uh, epsilon p approaches zero. And this uh, approximation is not a null intensity detection technique as it uses a near orthogonal pre post selection of the state corresponding to a small overlap of the space offset. So, using our uh, interferometric weak measurement uh, protocol, we have achieved uh, the uncertainty in alpha, that is the rotation, to be 0 0.008 radian. Whereas, when we are using a standard polarimetry, the delta alpha is found to be 0.08. So this provides evidence of the potential advantage and the polarimetric sensitivity enhancement of the determination of optical rotation alpha or any other polarization and isotropy. Uh, uh, and this is just a proof of concept that we have demonstrated here, but uh, this has to be improved further by having a perfect uh, interferometric spectrum uh, and uh, thereby we can actually uh, reduce this delta alpha value even further. So that is uh, regarding the interferometric peak value amplification. Now I want to go to a different uh, uh, perspective where uh, since I've mentioned that uh, the AV approximation is based on the linear response regime. So here, uh, what I'm trying to tell is that a weak value of an observable and the complex zero of the response function of a system. Uh, so there, uh, in, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it is uh, the AAV approximation is in the linear response. That is, there is an upper bound for the epsilon value, that is the offset value here. So efforts have therefore been delivered to extend the theory of this pre-post uh, selection system beyond the conventional uh, linear response regime by taking into account uh, relevant higher order terms, where in AAV they have taken only the first order terms. Uh, in expansion of the complex parameter and the higher order weak values. It is therefore important to explore ways to achieve the weak value amplification that can exceed this conventional limit. Uh, also, uh, the weak value through experimentally, we, we need to detect this weak value through experimentally accessible properties, such as uh, the response function of the system. 
So we first uh, establish a relationship between the weak value and the complex zero of the spatial response of the system, which will allow one to extract a large weak value amplification beyond this conventional limit. So in this, uh, we consider a weak interaction uh, of a, a spin hall effect of light in the momentum domain. So we consider the weak interaction uh, of a fundamental Gaussian due to partial reflection at a dielectric interface and the shift of the centroid in the Y direction of the Gaussian beam at the detection plane can be related with the uh, weak value. And uh, in the linear regime, that is a weak value amplification, uh, the minimum uh, bounded value of epsilon minimum is related by uh, the beam based, the wavelength of light used, uh, the reflection, the uh, reflection, final reflection coefficients, and the angle of incidence. So, if we go beyond epsilon minimum, uh, we cannot use this. So, to employ this, we uh, generalize uh, the expression of the reflected beam uh, vector from a dielectric interface uh, for a Gaussian beam with a linear polarization state where AP and AS represent the linear polarization state and where X here represents the coordinate in the plane of incident and Y is uh, the perpendicular to this plane. And the since uh, the weak measurement is performed on the Y direction of the spin hall effect of the light, so by nullifying the X direction shift of the goose, the uh, goose engine shift, uh, the reflected B will be uh, uh, like this of this form where uh, the ex uh, exponential minus ky square by 2 z square z0 by iz uh, is the gaussian b that is the pointer and gy is the spatial response uh, of the system which encodes the information on the change in field distribution due to the uh, weak interaction and the post selection so here, momentum domain shift is uh, related to the spatial response of the system and temporal domain uh, shift is uh, related to the frequency response of the system. So zero of the system, uh, the pre-post selection weak measurement is performed around the zero of the response function, which is this, which is uh, actually uh, clearly for epsilon not equal to zero, the root is complex the pre-post selection measurement is performed around this complex zero and complex zero, this root uh, uh, implies that the intensity of the reflected wave never becomes zero, rather it reaches a finite minimum. So the inverse relation between the zero and the weak value will be something like this, where the weak value real uh, root is related like this and imaginary root is related related like this. Now, how do we probe this real part experimentally? So uh, for real part, we uh, do the conventional weak measurement on the momentum domain uh, spin hall shift. Uh, and for imaginary, we take the interferometric measurement and uh, we measure this uh, uh, parameter called uh, geometric phase, which I'll get into, get into in a, a few slides. So yeah, so here, so this is the experimental setup uh, for uh, 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 the real root. Uh, here, uh, where you have a pre-selected state of polarizer, yeah, this is the reflected from, partially reflected from the uh, dielectric interface and post-selected with, uh, linear, again, a linear polarizer. So here you can see that uh, for epsilon uh, 0 0.008 and 0 0.005, so this is at zero, uh, zero and you can see the shift of the beam. Uh, so for point, point 0.08, the shift is uh, greater when compared to point 0.035, which is expected. So we plot the beam centroid shift for uh, varying values of epsilon, ranging from uh, point 0, 0, uh, uh, 0.005 uh, to uh, point 0, 0, 0, 0.035. So we can, by theoretically, by calculate, uh, by taking into account of the beam base wavelength of light and everything. So uh, first of all, I want to mention that this experimental system or the results that I'm uh, showing is for angle of incidence 45 degree. And with all these parameters, I can calculate what is the minimum bound on epsilon zero. And this is found to be 0 0.015. So beyond 0 0.015, you can uh, see a linear regime 
and you can calculate uh, the weak value uh, as uh, one does. But when you go, uh, that is uh, after epsilon minimum, the shape of the Gaussian profile is uh, not affected. It is retained. And you can uh, see a systematic shift in the pointer as well. But when you go epsilon very much less than this epsilon minimum value, uh, the shape of the pointer is actually affected. And this, so we, in order to uh, take the weak value, you need to go to the response function of the system to define the weak value where the conventional AAV limit breaks down. So to uh, at epsilon equal to zero, you can, uh, as I've shown in the GIF before, uh, at epsilon equal to zero, you can see a double hung Gaussian and uh, beyond plus 0 0.001 and minus 0 0.001, you can, uh, the intensity at one lobe is getting increased and for the other one, it is the other way around. So the real root can be extracted from the minima of the spatial uh, response function. So here, if epsilon equal to zero, the minima is at uh, zero in Y. Okay, uh, but as you increase this epsilon, the minima actually shifts. So the position of intensity minima actually tell, gives you the real root of the weak uh, 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 value. And uh, the uh, position of intensity minima scales as one by cot epsilon and the resultant weak value extracted from the position of intensity weak value is something like this, like this. So these values are extremely large and lie far beyond the familiar weak value regime uh, limit of the Gaussian pointer. Uh, so this is for the case of extraction of the real root. Now, uh, before going to the uh, extraction of imaginary root, uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, the concept of geometric phase here. So the propagation of light is associated with two types of phase factors, uh, the dynamical phase and the geometric phase. The dynamical phase is related to the optical path line. Geometric phase is related to the evolution of the electromagnetic wave. So spin redirection, but so again, geometric phase is again divided into two types, spin redirection and Panjaratnam burying. The former one actually is the continuous variation of the direction of propagation of the wave and Panjaratnam Bury phase accounts for the change in the state of polarization while propagating through an anisotropic medium. Now, since we have seen that uh, you have a pre-selection state in the case of this partial reflection, that is a spin halt, momentum domain spin halt shift, you have the pre-selection state to be a linear polarization. And after reflecting from the uh, dielectric surface, you have an inhomogeneous system. And again, you are post-selecting with the pure polarization. So here, uh, pre and the post selection is both homogeneous, but the intermediate uh, state uh, involving uh, the weak interaction is inhomogeneous. So there is an evolution of polarization state, which will lead to the generation of Panjaratnam Bury geometry phase. And this phase can be formulated using the Panjaratnam connection. So the geometric phase gradient along this transfer direction so if you take a Maxander interferometer, again interferometer, um, uh, you, uh, in one path you have this uh, weak interaction, the other is a normal reflection, and you take the fringe pattern, for plus epsilon and minus epsilon, you see a rotation in fringe as like this. For epsilon plus, plus epsilon and minus epsilon, you can see the tilt in fringe. So from this tilt in fringe, you can calculate the geometrical phase gradient and from which you can calculate weak value. So again, the weak value here is extremely large when compared to the uh, normal AAV regime. So that is it uh, regarding uh, the relation between uh, the response function and the weak value. Uh, do I have time? Uh, yeah, how, how long you need? You can take some time, no problem. Okay, so I thought that I'll uh, uh, show you some more work, but which is not related to weak measurement, but uh, it no, is mostly sure. related to phase. So it will take like a five to 10 minutes. Yeah, thank you. So this is a new thing that we have done recently. So this is a geometric phase polarimeter. 
So as I mentioned before, uh, a geometrical phase, when an inhomogeneous polarization system passes through a homogeneous medium, it actually uh, uh, creates the Panjaratnam geometric phase. So the usual way to calculate the spatially varying polarization status by measuring the Stokes parameters. So which usually takes a minimum of four measurement. Uh, so if you are con uh, dealing with a dynamical system where the state of polarization changes dynamically, that is very fastly, then it is very important to take your measurement in a single shot manner. So, so that your error, uh, so you don't mess up with the Stokes parameters and then you later on use the Stokes parameter to derive some other parameters. So we actually thought of uh, doing something like this to have a single shot measurement. So for this, we made, of, made use of this geometric phase uh, concept. And here, once again, we have taken a max and the interferometer. And in, this is a proof of concept, by the way. And in one path, you pass through a linear polarized light. In the other path, you pass a spatially varying polarized light. And this spatially varying polarized light is generated with a some component called spatial light modulator. So you apply some gradient level, something like this. It changes the polarization rotation. Uh, and changes the polarization and creates electricity. And you, so basically you have a inhomogeneous polarization after the spatial, rota uh, spatial light modulator and it's been passed through a homogeneous retarder, which is a half wave plate here, which rotates the polarization state um, uh, to theta, where theta is the uh, orientation angle of the half wave plate. Since I have uh, applied the gradient in y direction, uh, that will affect uh, the, the spatial contrast in the y direction. So this is the experimentally obtained fringe pattern where you can see that there is a spatial varying contrast in the uh, y direction. Now, how do I take out this polarization parameters? So the polarization parameters are uh, uh, represented by uh, delta. If you can... Uh, find this linear retardance in delta parameter and optical rotation, you can map the Stokes, polaris, uh, Stokes parameters. So for which we first calculate the dynamical phase associated with the interferometer. So the interferometer that we use have a dynamical phase. We calculate the uh, uh, dynamical phase by taking the interference pattern and applying the fast period transform method. And in the, such a situation, you don't apply any gradient uh, grayscale, so you apply a constant gray scale to the SLM, and you calculate the dynamical phase, and you apply as unknown spatially or spatially varying polarized light by applying the gradient in the grayscale, and you take this total phase by taking the interference pattern that I've shown here, and take the phase measurement. So you have total phase and dynamical phase, the difference of which will give you the geometrical phase. Now the geometrical phase is related by this relation, which is related to the optical rotation parameter and linear retardance parameter. By uh, properly calibrating the system before uh, making any measurement, we'll uh, calibrate the system by properly giving a, a different gray level value and uh, uh, determine the optical rotation in each gradient, in each gray level value. And you have the information of the uh, contrast, spatially varying contrast from the uh, Indifference pattern from each point, you can correspond to the optical rotation value. And you have the if you have the information of optical rotation and geometrical phase from this relation, you can carry out the linear retardance. So if you both have this linear retardance and the optical rotation, you can map the spatially varying polarization state where uh, the position along the beam, if I'm uh, 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 considering a Gaussian beam from uh, one end zero to the other end uh, to be uh, plus, that is uh, the dimension of the uh, beam is something like 400 micrometer here. So from one end to the other end, I can plot, uh, determine uh, the linear retardance and optical rotation and thereby can map the spatially varying polarization, right? And this is the result that I have uh, found for this geometrical phase polarimeter. Uh, and the latest work that we have done is related to the uh, or experimental observation of orbital Hall effect of light. So we know that light carries uh, spin angular momentum and orbital angular momentum. Spin is related to the circular polarization. 
and orbital angular momentum is related to the spatial profile of the beam. Uh, and it is again uh, uh, divided into intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic is related to the topological charge of the beam and extrinsic where there is a change in the center, you get the extrinsic orbital angular momentum. So orbital, so this was the first experimental uh, observation of orbital Hall effect of light. Orbital Hall effect is purely through orbit-orbit interaction. Uh, so it doesn't uh, involve any polarization. If you apply any polarization, any different polarization, random polarization or radial polarization, that does not depend on the shift. So it is just dependent on what is your angle of incidence on the partially reflecting surface and what your topological charges. So we model using um, uh, uh, angular spectrum method where we have the in incident beam, which is a sum of uh, fish of E and S and reflected beam, something like this. And you have the LG beam profile like this, where E raised to IL phi determines the topological charge, where L is the topological charge of the beam. And According to, uh, by applying the angular spectrum method, you get the reflected beam profile, something like this. Here you can see that after reflection, if you are applying just plus L value, after reflection, you get plus L, L plus one, L minus one factors as well. So you have uh, getting a superposition of different topological L values, that is contribution from other OAM values, uh, which account for the fact that uh, the, there is there will be a shift in the center of gravity of the beam. Now, this is our experimental setup. So we have observed this uh, orbital Hall effect for the case of random polarization as well as radial polarization. For random polarization, the result I'm showing will be for uh, L equal to six plus six and minus six. And uh, for radial polarization, uh, I'll be showing the uh, result for L equal to plus one and minus one. So this is a uh, numerical simulation where uh, uh, you can see the shifted vortex of random polarization and radial polarization. And in radial polarization, you can see that there is an asymmetry in the low intensity between plus one and minus one. So the simulation ranges from 15 degree to 70 degree here. So you can see as you uh, increase the angle of incident, the centroid or the center of gravity of the beam is shifting directly proportional. And this shift is largely dependent on this uh, topological charge as well. It is not dependent on the polarization here. So the orbital uh, Hall effect, so, so this is the experimental result that we are showing for angle of incidence uh, 30 degree, angle of incidence 57 degree and 70 degree. So the first row represents for the random polarization case and second row represents for the radial polarization, C, uh, polarization case where you can see uh, asymmetry in the uh, beam distribution. And in the random polarization case, you can see the centroid shift or the center of gravity shift in the beam. So another way to determine this orbital Hall effect is by again by interferometry. You can take the phase measurement if you don't have any orbital Hall effect, you don't have any superposition of L, L values, that is the mixture of other OAM components. So you have the phase structure, something like this. So as soon as you have a partial reflection, you have the other components. So naturally, there will be a uh, decrease in the phase value. So as you can see from here. So by determining the decrease in the phase value, this will be again another proxy for the detection of orbital Hall effect of light. So I'm pretty much covered what we do in the lab for the past two, three years, uh, ranging from the weak measurement, the interferometric weak measurement protocol where you amplify the polarization by a large factor, uh, something like delta alpha to be 0 0.008 when compared to 0 0.02 radian for the standard measurement, then we uh, go to the nonlinear regime where AAV conventional limit fall fails. Uh, uh, that information is taken from the system response function. And the other work that we did is uh, alternative method to measure the space varying polarization state of light in a single shot manner where if you have a dynamical phase, you can uh, measure in a single shot manner. The other one that I've shown, the later one part I've shown is the experimental observation of orbital Hall effect of light. 
And with this, I am done. Uh, thank you. So questions? Okay, you can read the chat box if there are some questions. Uh, there are no questions in the chat box and not on the YouTube channel as well. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. You know that towards the end, you know, this uh, last one, I think. Hall of Fame. Right. Interference pattern which you showed, yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah. L is equal to plus 6, L is equal to minus 6. Yeah. Is there any, you know, what's the physical meaning of, uh, you know, these tips kind of thing you count? There are so many of them. Yeah. So you are interfering this with basically, which I have, uh, I did not mention, I suppose. Uh, so the uh, so if you have two paths, one path you are having the OAM beam, the other path you are having a Gaussian beam. So you, when you have the interference between the Gaussian beam and the uh, phase singularity, you have this phase singularity region. So that is reflected on the interference pattern. So you have a fork pattern here. So the fork pattern, so that how many bifurcations you have depends upon the topological charge you have. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So here the interference is made with the Gaussian beam, which I did not mention. I'm so, sorry for okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Madhira. Thank you. You know, really state of the art kind of measurement. These are the things which are eventually becoming quantum also because you heard Professor Bridman was talking about a single photon. Then there were some talks from Ingrid Italy on these kind of things. Mm -hmm. So the great thing is that it is wave property, so you can do with light right here in our own labs. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Atira, and so we'll close the session here. See you tomorrow. Thank you.